Shabbat Shalom, everyone. My name is Noel Joshua Hadley, and this is the Unexpected Cosmology. Today's not any ordinary Sabbath either. Now, I know that most of you are on different calendars. Some of you have already celebrated Day of Atonement. Some of you haven't celebrated Day of Atonement yet. But uh, by the time this goes live, I will have been finishing up the Day of Atonement. It's a day of fasting. It's a day of prayer, a day of repentance. All that to say, I hope everybody is enjoying the Fall Feast. Now, this is a new format. Uh, we're making some changes over here at the Unexpected Cosmology. Normally what happens is that at the end of Sabbath, on a Saturday at 7 p.m., I meet with my Discord group and we I give my presentations over there. Well, this is the big move. I'm moving over to YouTube Live and I will be giving my presentations over here. There's a number of reasons I'm making the move. I'll give you two of them. One is that a great deal of my listeners, as well as my readers, have been requesting that I get to some back-to-basic Torah uh, material. And of course, what's better than the Torah portions? Here we are in the Fall Feast, and what happens is, is when you finish Sukkot, which is coming up in the next week, you roll back, you roll up the Torah, and you start again in Genesis. You know, you end in Deuteronomy, you start in Genesis. So within the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be starting Torah portions on Friday nights, 7 p.m. live. And this is going to be unique from a lot of the other stuff out there. This is not going to be your father's Bible study because we're going to be looking at the Paleo Hebrew. For the next year, I'm going to be committing on Friday nights to uh, go through the Paleo Hebrew. Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy, week for week, line for line. So please come by, be a part of the community, participate. And afterwards, after I'm live here at YouTube, I'm going to be going back to my Discord group and we're going to have the after party over there. So that gives everybody listening an opportunity to connect in the community. All that being said, my last presentation that I gave with my Discord group has not gone to YouTube yet. That's going to be what I'm going to be showing you tonight. This is the Book of Wisdom. The Book of Wisdom can be found in the Colbrin. And if you saw my three-part series on the Book of Britain, the Book of Britain and Book of Wisdom are side by side with each other. They're complementary. And I, I specifically did Book of Britain first because the Book of Britain is attributed to the writings of Joseph of Arimathea when he came over to Britain. It's a mysterious book, but like the title, Book of Britain, we know it takes place in Britain. And Joseph of Arimathea, or Joseph of Rama, is attributed to being the father of the faith to the Britons. And what he did was, when he came over to Britain, is he confronted the Druids. And I've already shown you in Acts chapter 29, which is the missing chapter of Acts, that can be found uh, inserted back into the Sefer Bible after Acts 28. Paul goes over to Britain and he too confronts the Druids. And interestingly enough, the Druids state that they were uh, Yahudim originally and that they had come from Egypt. And most likely when they came from Egypt, they came with Baruch and Yermiyahu or Jeremiah. Of course, why was Yermiyahu and Baruch in Egypt? Well, they left Yehuda when the Babylonians came and conquered. Nebuchadnezzar gave Yermiyahu an open purse to do what his mission was. He took a Yehudan princess, uh, T. Tepi, according to tradition, and he went up to Ireland. Originally, he went to Spain, then he went to Ireland. And it appears as though his disciples uh, ended up in Britain. They ended up being the Druids. And so that's where we get to this very mysterious book, Book of Britain and Book of Wisdom. And the two go in hand in hand. So that's basically your introduction. The, the origins of the book itself, when it was written, it is very mysterious. We really don't know. But I think you guys are going to enjoy this. So without further ado, here is Book of Wisdom. It's going to be the last two weeks that I presented to my uh, other community. I hope you guys enjoy this. Rather than discussing it, I want to go straight into get a little bit better light here. Go straight into the Book of Wisdom. I am going to, uh, I already dropped this in here for you guys starting out, but um, here it is again, Book of Wisdom. And uh, let's get right into it. I, I, I love Book of Wisdom. Like, however fun and and, and incredible uh, Book of Britain was to discover and read, this one is just going to blow your guys' mind. I mean, it when it when it says Book of Wisdom, it, it doesn't disappoint. Like, this is a Book of Wisdom. It's not a Book of Semi Wisdom or Little Wisdom or Maybe Wisdom or Let's Discuss It Wisdom. Like, this is some seriously wise uh, or uh, not wise guy wisdom either. You know, not wisecracks. This is like the book of wisdom and as you can see here there are 
uh, 22 chapters. We are obviously not getting through this tonight. That's okay. Let's not rush a good thing. And as I told you earlier, the first chapter, if I recall, uh, deals a lot with government and rights. So I think I need a little bit more coffee here. I need to take a quick little breather. All right. Here we go. Chapter one, meditation and morals. I need to expand this here for my eyes. The only way a man can become fully awakened spiritually is to know his true nature, right? Quest for the Holy Grail is to know thyself and to strive for communication with the spiritual realm. And the way you do that is within yourself, right? Not exterior to you, but, you know, within yourself. That's how we communicate with the spiritual realm. And we can only do that by being mindful to our soul and our spirit and how our body is separate but connected with that. This can best be achieved by meditation or perhaps mindfulness. I actually like that, you know, because meditation is such a heavy word. We're like, oh, no, no, Christians, we don't meditate, right? Because that's a, you know, that's an Eastern concept. But it's like, no, 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 no. There's, there's a mindfulness here to this. Uh, and it says, or perhaps mindfulness expresses it better. And I think that does. This is a state of conscious awareness, not a conscious, uh, a lack of consciousness, total conscious awareness of all the potentialities within man, the ability to cut off all material disturbances and to bring the spirit into harmonious relationship with the higher, more compatible realm. It means gaining, gaining complete mastery over all material impulses, urges, and desires. So think about this, okay? Uh, we had uh, a while ago, uh, Sean Walking Bear, he might be here tonight, I'm not sure. And he was talking about when he would go off on his... Uh, you know, meditation, his, his uh, spiritual quest. And, you know, you're immediately, you go off into the woods, you uh, derobe yourself of comforts. And, you know, you might not even have a fire. You might not even have a sleeping bag, whatever. You're not eating any food. You might not be drinking any water. And your mind starts wandering to all these other places. You start thinking about your loved ones, your family, uh, which, is, which is great for prayer, by the way. If, if I, the faces come to my, my mind, I, I pray for them, right? And then, and go for there. But, you know, you start thinking about hunger, you start thinking about, you know, whatever it might be, and uh, what you want to watch on TV later. And it's, it's so hard to, to scrub all of that out of your head, and be mindful of, you know, your soul, your spirit, right? And all the, as they say, all the uh, potential within. Okay, so uh, it means gaining complete mastery over all material impulses, urges, and desires. When a conscious awakened spirit occupies a material body in a conscious unity, the whole being is united with the divine. It expands out beyond the limitations of space and time. Mindfulness controls the thoughts and feelings in clear and inner place, so that in silence and peace, it is ready to receive an influx of the divine mindfulness. And meditation opens a way of communication, whereby the spirit of man may communicate with the spirits surrounding the divine. It is a higher form of prayer, a controlled concentration of thought. Clearing an inner space to form the shrine of the heart does not mean that it serves no purpose. The usefulness of a cave is in its empty space. The usefulness of a basket or pot is in its emptiness. And we, we talk about these allegories even within Christianity, right? Like, you know, you have to be, you know, he, he can use us if we are an empty vessel, right? And he can fill it up with what, if it's already filled up, then Yah can't fill it up, right? All wisdom and all knowledge, the answer to every question, are not to be found outside of man, but within him. He needs to ask outside himself for the solution to the riddle of his nature. Oh, I'm sorry. He need not. I, was, I knew I was reading that wrong. He need not ask outside of himself for the solution to the riddle of his nature. He needs not traverse the earth to find the answer. I mean, I've done that. I've, I've gone on the, the quest to, to discover myself. And every time I go on these quests to discover myself... I never find the answer there, right? It was here all along. I didn't need, I didn't need to go anywhere. It can be reached from within himself. There too, he will find all that supplies the needs of his spirits. And remember um, what we finished up in the Book of Britain, the last line was, actually, let me see if I can read this again. Uh, sickness is first a, a malady of the mind, right? So it, sickness, mo most disease, it comes from the lack of health within our soul. 
In his daily life and in all he does, each man should conduct himself as though intending to be a living example to others. He should act as though proclaiming his dedication to service in the greatest cause any man can serve and as though inviting others to join him. Right. Remember, we went through earlier tonight how nobility is not in your genealogy. It's not in if you if you claim any kind of nobility or morality based on your parents or your, you know, where you come from and, you know, the, the wealth and all that kind of stuff. They say you are robbing them. They're the ones that have nobility, not you. Right. So you can't base your nobility on anybody else. And if you find that nobility within, you need to share it with everybody. You need to live in such a way that you are inviting others to take up the same cause to be these same moral uh, vessels, you know, these vessels that are empty that Yah fills. He should be a leader showing the way and a guide indicating the path others should follow, the path each man or each must travel alone. If you guys uh, paid attention to this last Thursday when I entered a quote-unquote discussion, it was more of a debate, but uh, one of the things I said in there is that I think I said, and what I intended to say was that I'm under no obligation to answer anybody's questions whatsoever. When people come at me with questions like, what about this? What about that? It's like, well, you have that question. So why don't you uh, look into it? I'm not going to hold your hand because if I'm going to hold your hand, you're not going to internalize this. You're not going to discover this. You're not going to have that gnosis of you know self-discovery. And and when people are feel entitled that you, you have to convince me, and if you don't convince me, then I am under no obligation to pursue this. It's like, well, you're lost because I'm not going to try to convince you, right? Uh, okay, so um, let's see. Okay, and that's what it says. That each man, this journey we go on to, each man has to take the journey to travel alone. Now, one of the great things here is that when we're on this narrow journey, um, you know, this is what Yahushua said, that he who doesn't, hate his father and mother. He doesn't forsake him to follow me. He's not worthy of me, right? And we've all seen this where a lot of our family and our friends and our former from our former life hate us, but they despise this journey we're on. But one of the great things about this journey is that when you're on this narrow path, you look from time to time and there's these people taking the journey with you. And a lot of you are here tonight because you are taking this journey with me. And that's, you know, it's not, it doesn't have to be a lonely journey. We meet people along the way. Every thinking man must surely realize now that there is something more of life than a search for happiness, wealth, or luxury. That life must be more than an idle drifting. And the only efforts being bent towards seeking the still waters of contentment and the shallows of pleasure. There must be more than walking around seeking enjoyment. There is indeed something more to it than that. There is a purpose to life, and that purpose is living. This is great. So we're talking right now, the meaning to life is living. And they're going to, of course, go into this. What is living, right? You know, uh, it, it is to, uh, it is to discover, right? The, the Holy Grail, right? The, the soul within the, the, the realization that we are, you know, the sons of Elohim, right? That's the test. And of course, we come here and we're lied to from the moment we're babies. Every step along the way, you know, Satan and the Satans and our controllers and the, the, the terrors are here to just lie to us and keep us keep us from moving forward. You know, they, they want to they don't want to enter the kingdom and they're going to try to keep us from entering the kingdom to really, truly live. Living is meant in its fullest sense. It does not refer to mortal life alone. Right. So we're taking this to the soul. We're not earthly pleasures here. That's not what they're talking about with living. Mortal life is the servant, the threshold of a greater life and should be regarded only in this life. I love that so much. This body right here, this mortal body is my servant. My true self is within. This is all here to serve me. And if I'm not, uh, this, you know, my, ultimately my soul needs to serve my body in a way because, you know, then my body is going to be unhealthy and it's not going to serve my soul. It goes both ways. The duty of all is to awaken their own spirit to consciousness, right? Wake up. If, however, this has not been achieved, then the best thing to do is to follow the precepts and advice contained in the writings of those who have themselves awakened their spirits to consciousness. Excuse me. You know, drink a coffee here. For the first step, it is sufficient to be self-controlled and self-disciplined. The efforts of every man being bent towards learning more about himself. 
He must cultivate. And when we see all this arguing out there and this accusations and name calling, those people you can know, like they're not they're not living by the standard. They're not going out there. They're not self-controlled. They're not self-disciplined. They're projecting this onto others. They're saying you're not self-disciplined. You're not self-controlled. And they're just pointing the finger. And it's like that's all projecting. It, it, they need to be focused on themselves. That's what this journey is about. Not looking to others, looking to ourselves, transforming our own heart, right? I keep telling you guys that the Torah is a transformative document. It is not just a, a, like a rule book to check off. It's to transform our lives. He must cultivate mindfulness to discover his own motives and to know that's a lot of, that could save you a lot of therapy right there. If you can figure out <laughs> what's causing you to do things you do. Uh, and to know what lies behind every thought, you know, Freud eats your heart out, every word and action. He must discover every cause and understand its effect. He must know why he does a certain thing and by what means he achieves it. He must decide upon a plan of life, upon certain objectives, and carry them through to a successful conclusion. He must choose a path and follow it through to the end, not looking too far ahead that he ignores what lies be before his feet. Another way you could maybe say is, you know, don't have your head in the clouds, right? Your, your feet need to be grounded. He must firmly ignore the cries of diverting desires and disregard the bypass of foolish fancies. And this almost reminds me of like Pilgrim's Progress. You know, he's on this path and the whole time he's passing all these carnal like cities and these other people. And he just has to keep his eyesight on the road in front of him and, and stop with all the diversions that's just going to pull him off the road. As yet, no mortal man knows the true laws of justice, and no mortal man has ever seen the face of truth unveiled. Now, some of you are going to, I could see some responses here, and people are like, oh, no, you know, Yeshua is the truth. Well, he is the truth. He is the truth, the way, and the life, right? But the, the, the way, the truth, and life is also the Torah, which he embodied, but he said that everything he uh, said and did, he learned from the Father, and no man has seen or heard the Father but Yahushua HaMashiach, who came down to tell us what the truth is, right? So they say this all through here, that no man has truly seen the truth, right? It's all coming down from heaven, and I think this agrees with Scripture. No man has yet risen sufficiently in greatness to proclaim his ability to live free from all restraint imposed by others. Some may proclaim their ability or right to do so, but these do it not from strength but from moral weakness. Their affirmation of their own freedom is in fact a declaration of war upon the liberties of others. They are no more than spineless creatures who decry the laws of morality and high principles only because these seek to restrain their baser instincts and restrain their uh, unhealthy carnal outlets. While disparaging the existing codes, whereby men live, they have neither the ability nor the strength to replace them with anything equally good and worthy. Certainly, whatever they did produce would never tend towards the spiritual elevation of mankind. Such as these must not be pandered to, and if they refuse to bear their fair share of the burdens of mankind, they should not be humored. And the Didache, if you guys have ever read the Didache, which is the, the, the instructions, apparently, of the apostles to the, the, the church, it's all about this, too. It's like if, if someone is going to come into your congregation and they're just going to complain and they're just going to want things and everybody else is the problem and I'm being persecuted. And it's like it's like the people who complain the most, like I said, the people who contribute the least. It always comes down to that way. Like the people who contribute the most complain the least. It's amazing how that works. And it's saying like these people who who aren't even living by a standard of of what we just read, of living a certain moral code in the way that they're setting example for other people, don't even don't even humor these people. Just let them go off and bicker and complain how they're you know being persecuted everywhere they go. They're, they're a dime a dozen. They're everywhere. Those who seek to assert their individuality at the expense of others are a menace, not to be tolerated. The rule shall be that everyone is to be granted the greatest possible freedom up to but not beyond the point where it infringes upon the freedom, rights, or contentment of others. 
man, it's like, oh my goodness. It's like, you know, <laughs> yeah, like how dare you try to stick that needle in my arm? You know, like that's, that, that is, it's my right. You're imposing on my rights. It is impossible to give complete freedom to any man and no man is, and no man is worthy of it. I, I think that's a great line. Any freedom attained at the expense of another man is an unworthy freedom. So no man has the right to, you know, be put down at all. So you could live your life. No man has the right to condemn a moral code or standard of principles until he himself has risen above them. Like I'm just getting like, I, I want to do like summer sauce right now. This is so good. Let me just read this again. No man has the right to condemn any moral code or standard, standard principles until he himself has risen above them. Let us remind ourselves of this as we, you know, call out the sick, sadistic, sociopathic elite, you know, who are running our world. They're evil people. But then we see all amongst the ranks, amongst, you know, these truthers and other things, some very wicked people as well. And they're, you know, condemning others. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like you haven't even, you haven't even internalized any of this yet. You know, you're just put, putting, like you would do the same thing if you were in power. You would be maybe even worse. No, uh, we saw that a couple weeks ago when Yahusha said that when he he left the rich people in the table and he went out and talked to the prostitutes and, and the sailors and the drunks, and and he was being condemned for it. He's like, whoa, 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 you think these people are immoral? Well, you know, you know, those people in there are actually worse, right? So always remember that. I know I kind of just you know flipped that myself, but it goes both ways. No laws, no uh, no laws, no principles, and no codes should be discarded until they have been replaced by something proven to be better. Uh, now we have so many bad laws now. <laughs> I think I would kind of uh, be you know be like to the writer of this, like you know, can we just dump a lot of these laws right now and just find better ones because this isn't working? Because I can you know think of a lot of better laws, like less laws. Uh, the replacement of those already established anywhere is no easy task and one certainly far beyond the experience and ability of any one person. Therefore, in the present condition and development of mankind, goodness and righteousness are expressed by the discipline, acceptance of the moral law and courageous submission to the written law. There must, however, evolve with, with man to meet his changing and greater needs. I know that word evolve is a modern word. I will remind you that this translation comes from like 2010 or some like 1990s or something like that. So I would love to see an 18, the 1800s document. I don't have that in my possession. And of course, there's a, a much older one, an older, you know, ancient, uh, you can't even call it English. It's like Welsh or something like that. But anyways, yeah. So that's obviously a modern word there uh, to evolve. An evil custom or law is to be cast aside, even though it is established and accepted by many ger generations. And, you know, that's kind of like, even, even like with Christianity, where they're like, you know, they've thrown out the Torah and you try to explain to them, no, no, this is a good law we need to put back in. And they're like, but, but, but how could the past generations be wrong about that? There's been too many that have thrown it aside. Like, it can't be true what you're saying. Right. And it's like, no, like, you know, either some, if something is bad, you need to cast it out. And if something is good, even if past generations cast it out, you need to bring it back. A good customer law should be taken over and followed. The Torah, even if it, it even if it be observed by your enemies and followed by them, right? How many of you have been called a Judaizer or a Jew for, uh, you know, the, the the people running the world for following the Torah, right? Even this is controlled opposition. Even things like in Islam, how many times have you heard? Oh, well, you know, they do that in Islam. You know, that that's proof that you. Should, it's like, well, actually, no. There, there's some good things in Islam that they do too, right? If it's a good law, we should uphold it. The decision uh, as to what is good and what is bad cannot lie within the provenance of any one man. Laws are made and laws are changed, but no man truly knows what is right and what is wrong. So they're not talking about a heavenly law here, right? They're talking about government laws, just, just to clarify for anyone out there. This can be discovered only in the inspired books compiled by the hands of illuminated men. So we want to find laws to live the land. Hmm, maybe there's like these, these books that tell us what the laws are. <laughs> it's like there's five of them uh, that I can think of at the beginning of our Bibles. 
the time is not far distant when man should no longer think in terms of being good or wicked, rich or poor, sick or healthy, but in terms of being spiritual or material. Again, so if you, you know, wicked people live by their material lust, right? Uh, and you know, same with sick people, right? Or poor people, right? They're, li- they're you know, and um, yeah, so either you're, you know, poor in spirit or rich in spirit, so on and so forth. The basic motive behind a righteous and good life is not the quest for happiness. Righteousness, goodness, and morality, morality are other words meaning self-discipline, duty, obligation, and service. These form a foundation upon which a proper way of life can be built. And within the framework of this foundation, the quest for happiness is certainly not restricted. Indeed, not only is it encouraged, but also earnestly urged. Now, notice what just happened. Um, within there was a there was a study done out there uh, some time ago, and they they followed divorced people versus married people. Now, if there are some divorced people out there, you may fully disagree with me, and I'm not talking about every situation. Okay, I am not talking about any one person here. But these psychologists followed, like they followed, like. 10, they follow like some like 20 people or, or some large, some section of people, uh, half of them who divorced and half of them who stayed married. And in every case starting out, they were at their, the end wits, like they were ready, they were ready to just end the whole thing. And these are just brought in bad marriages. And they found that the, the marriages who decided to stick together, keep the family together, even though they couldn't, they couldn't understand how they could possibly be happy under the situation. 10 years down the road, as he analyzed them, the, the couples who stayed together were happy. They were happier than those who divorced to pursue happiness. Okay. So again, I'm not talking about every case out there, but there's something, what they're talking about here is that many people will reject righteousness, goodness, morality, or they, as they say, duty, obligation, and service and self-discipline because they think that won't bring them happiness. They pursue happiness. It's a fool's game. And they're not happy, but actually people who uh, who do follow through with these things actually can find happiness. You see how that works? It's kind of interesting. You find purpose in life, and that brings you happiness, a true happiness, not a shallow, superficial happiness. And I don't know how you can measure or gauge happiness in that study, but you know that's what they concluded, that people who stayed with their families, stayed married, and just decided to devote themselves to that lifestyle were ultimately happier. Nearly everyone has principles of some sort, but all have a tendency to push back the frontiers of these principles to suit themselves. Their idea of of morality is subordinated to their material interest. Men should not be hypocrites with themselves and should freely admit to this tendency to sub... I lost a few people there when I talked about the divorce. Uh, Men should not be hypocrites with with themselves and should freely admit to this tendency to subordinate their principles to their own selfish interest. A standard of morality or code of principles, which is not absolute and unshakable, is worthless as a support and no standard at all. Only the very wisest of men can set their own standards. And the wisest of men are too wise to do so. Did you just, did you guys just get that? Let me read that again. They're basically saying that um, uh, you moral men will set their own standards of morality. And it's like, don't do that. And it says, it says this, Only the very wisest of men can set their own standards. They can decide what is moral and what is not uh, or for themselves, right? But it it says, but if if you're truly that wise, you're too wise to do so, right? You keep to the standard. As far as man is concerned, the purpose of life is development and preparation for something greater. Repeated themes. This cannot be undertaken in a half-hearted manner or at specific times. It is a process continuing every minute of the day. Every waking moment, even when you sleep, you're preparing, right, for uh, your development, preparation for the greater uh, eternity. Every task confronting man here is purposeful and necessary, even though its reason and end may be obscure. Even if you don't get it, it's okay. The measures of the duties, obligations, and service demanded from any man is dependent upon the strength, talents, and possessions which have been bestowed upon him. The more man has, the stronger he is. So must the returns be in proportion, for he is that much better able to serve 
Now, this this right here came directly through Joseph of Arimathea uh, from a quote from Yahushua HaMashiach. And he said, look, there's, there's nothing wicked. There's nothing wrong with being rich. If you're stinking filthy rich, awesome. Awesome. Now take that and feed the poor. You have that to, you know, to, to take servants and, and pay your servants, have people work for you, you know, actually provide food on other people's table. You're not just giving your money away. You're actually having people work for you. This is good. Right. And um, one guy approached you, Hushal Mashiach, in the books of the Nazarene. And he's like, he's like, I've got a lot of money and uh, I keep giving to people. I keep giving all my money to people. And he was like, OK, that's good. Sounds good. You know, and he's like, well, when does it stop? I'm tired of giving money to people. I, I don't want to keep doing this. And then Yahushua said, well, uh, you, you, the only way you're going to enter the kingdom is it would be better for you just to get rid of all your riches. Get rid of it all now. Just to get rid of it. Just live a poor life. It's the only way you're going to enter because you have those riches to um, to take care of the poor, to provide for them. Right. That, that's the uh, uh, you know, and give people work and stability and, and give people a better life. You know, give lead people to the same life you have. That's your whole, pur pur whole purpose. OK, what did I just read here? Um, every test confronting man here is purposeful. OK, uh, well, I might read this paragraph again. Apologies. The measure of the duties, obligations and service demanded from any man is dependent upon the, sh the strength, talents and possessions which have been bestowed upon him. OK, we already read that. The more a man has, the stronger he is. So must the returns be in proportion, for he is that much better able to serve. Every man has been given according to the extent of the service expected from him. And it's all part of the test. And I, sometimes I think maybe um, some of us, maybe who has a lot um, versus those who have a little. I almost wonder if that's something to do with our pre-existent self. You know, like, you know, y'all knows like, you know, much, you know, you've been given less because maybe you've been you know, know that you're not going to be able to handle it as well. I, I don't know. It's just something to think about. One of the less easy tasks for the enlightened man is to develop, develop the ability to genuinely assess the service to be rendered in return for the things with which he has been endowed and to serve without selfish hesitation. Each man has his particular place in the ranks of those who serve, and his own talents and possessions should be regarded only as a means of enlarging the pool of common good and the advancement of mankind. Those who deny their obligations inflict a lonely, awful doom upon themselves. As the weakness and faltering of any one man lessen the total of service rendered and retard the advance, it becomes the obligation of the strong to protect the weak, not in order that they should be shielded from things leading to their ultimate good or to carry a burden they decline, but to help them towards the attainment of strength. The aim should always be toward increasing the total amount of strength and ability at the disposal of the whole. Suffering and affliction are unavoidable if man is to develop into the godlike being intended. He must grow spiritually strong possessing both courage and compassion, and to do this, he cannot be protected from suffering and affliction. Can the uh, over-sheltered plant kept indoors withstand either the sun's heat or the windy blast? Compassion was awakened in the heart of man only through suffering, and the noble qualities of courage and dedication were roused only through affliction. Again, so going back to the theme of this earth, the earth was designed in a way to afflict us and to test us and to uh, discipline us, right? And so they're saying, look, if you're, if you're a house plant, you know, and you're going to, leaves are going to fade if it goes on sun, you're not, you're not living as you were designed to do. Those who in the past bore their suffering with fortitude became uplifting examples to their fellow men. And obviously we see in society today, there's not a lot of great examples out there, right? We're just a weak people. We have become a, you know, materialistic, fleshly, uh, We've lost touch with our spirit, our soul, our inner self, all these things that they're talking about. We don't have. And, and it's back in the past when, when mankind stood up to affliction and, and you know, and were tried. And, and think about like um, just recently, the, the, the Great Depression generation, like the people who were raised in the Great Depression, like they were a generation. This generation went off and fought the war. Like they were an incredible generation. Um, and it, like the generation today just pales in comparison to how great that generation was. All right. Um, man, I keep uh, I keep repeating. What was I? I'm going to start on 21. I think I already went 20. 
What any man has to face and overcome is unimportant. What really matters is how he faces it and by what means he overcomes it. Where a man stands is also unimportant. The important thing is, is the direction in which he is moving. Life on earth was never meant to be spent in rest and tranquility. Its very tribulations and problems give it an added zest for those brave spirits who face up to them with courage and cheerfulness. Each man must discover for himself his own weakness and, frail and frailty. The creating divinity could have brought a painless world into being, but it would also have been one without purpose. Well, there's your answer to pain and suffering right there too. It could have been a uh, people with perfect beings, but these could not have understood the meaning of suffering and tribulation. They would have been devoid of pity, tenderness, and sympathetic understanding. And yet human nature is always to try to, to get such a wealth that we live in comfort so that we don't have to experience the very things that Yah designed for us. I mean, here's adding to more of the, to the understanding of why you know, the very wealthy are least likely to enter the kingdom, right? And yet that's what we all aspire to do, to be the wealthy rather than enter the kingdom. I mean, that's just human nature. It is not through the divine will that man suffers. The divine will is that man fulfill the divine plan through learning to overcome the restrictions and illusions of a material existence by rising above them. The troubles and trials are there to goad man on, to stimulate him, to rouse him out of material lethargy, and urge him towards the development of spirituality and wisdom. If man suffers unduly, it is because of his own heedlessness and waywardness, his ignorance of the true meaning and purpose of life. And again, I would say to many of the people out there who just go out and complain and complain, and they're never happy, and no matter how much you help them and all these kind of things, and they, they don't get it. They don't get it at all. Like, they're looking for this comfort, which they can't get. They don't realize that they're they're here to, you know, to, to C.S. Lewis talked about it. I think they actually do later on in this book uh, that the uh, like a perfect, like a stone, right? In every stone, there's a statue. And so C.S. Lewis, I remember he gave this example. It might have been in Mere Christianity where he says, you know, Yah is like he's he's chiseling at the rock. And he's trying to form this into a beautiful statue. And meanwhile, the rock, which is us, we're all kicking and screaming. And, ah, you know, we don't want this. But because we're not uh, handing ourselves over to that, that pain and suffering, that, that, that discipline and chastisement, if you prefer that. Uh, we don't understand that it's all here to make us into a beautiful creature yeah, internally. The earth isn't perfect because its imperfections are essential. The social imperfections, as distinct from the natural imperfections, are the result of man's lack of understanding and his dedication to material ends rather than the spiritual ones. Again, so that tells you right there, if, if you hear, and Christianity is all about this. They're like, you know, the world is this imperfect place. And it was, it, it, it's the way it is because purely of Adam's sin. And we get this from, I think, Romans 2, the, the groaning of the earth, right? Uh, and, and it's like, well, you know, when you understand, like, uh, you know, you look at like the shape of the earth, the, the, the you know, the, 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 you call it the geological columns and all these things and how we're literally standing on these organisms of the past and how Yah is always bringing this judgment and reshaping the world and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it, it literally is the world was created perfectly for everything they're describing here. And so if people see this as an imperfect world and they don't like the way the world is. Uh, we're, we're not we're not talking about the news. We're talking about nature. OK, then then um, then they are living. They're revealing to you that they are living for material means. They want a materialism that is it's kind of like a wisp of wind. It's not really there. They're living for the American dream or whatever else. The trials and tests resulting from the natural imperfections of earth do not oppress men, man nearly as much as the afflictions man has brought upon himself. Isn't that the truth? through seeking to establish a life wholly within the material. It is necessary to know the difference between the two and to separate from one from the other. The reason that there is so little divine intervention is not that the divine remains indifferent, and this is one of the big criticisms by atheists, agnostics, so on and so forth, but that man has been given all the powers and wisdom necessary to deal with the affairs of the earth. If he fails to make use of them, who is then to blame? 
You get that? So if Elohim is to come down and intervene all the time, uh, and then he's to blame. He's the reason it's all wrong. And it's like, no, no, it's, it's our fault. We can't point the finger at Elohim. If he fails to make use of them, who is to blame? The duty and obligation placed upon man relate to his reaching upward towards spirituality and outward towards perfection. If man declines to do this, he must accept the consequences and can blame none but himself. You can't blame God. You know, a lot of people, uh, some people very close to me, I won't say who, but some people very close to me have admitted, like they're just, they've lived their whole lives angry at God. It's all his fault, you know, for death in the family, death of loved ones, you know, uh, they're, 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 uh, the fact that they're in debts, you know, all these things, it's all his fault. At least they're honest because most people aren't even that honest about it. Were there no pain and suffering, man would be like a jellyfish drifting aimlessly with the currents in a sea of matter. Suffering, pain, and sorrow result from an existence within a material body and are not a part of man's spiritual heritage. So again, we, we talk about heritage no, nobility, right? So, uh, you know, your your physical, no, your genealogy is meaningless, uh, but uh, the pain and suffering is not from your, I mean, that, that's all you, right? It's... Uh, the bonds of humanity are forged in the furnaces of life and not in, in its tranquil breezes. These are the directions for those who follow the great path of the true way. The never failing guides and sustainers be grateful for the good things of life. Be patient under suffering and steadfast in adversity. Be diligent in the performance of your duty and never shirk your obligations. Bear the blows of affliction with cheerfulness and courage. Do not be quick to anger. Hasty to argue or ration judgment, for this reveals your lack of self-control. Avoid the weaknesses of unjust hate and envy, for they rebound upon yourself. Do not engage in undue uh, frivolity, frivol frivolity. I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. I just can't get it. I know, I know how to say it, but I'm saying it wrong. Lest people come to think you petty-minded. Keep your temper under control, for an angry person is a confused one. Let your deportment be serene and confident. Keep your mind above earthly things and look towards the kingdom of the Ruach and mansions of the soul. Never pay homage to evil men and never commend what is wrong. Do not use lewd expressions or foul language, for this advertises your inferiority to others. Do not laugh at sly or dirty humor. For this displays an unclean and unhealthy mind. Do not raise money or possessions to the stat status of a god. Fit yourself to earn an honest and useful livelihood. Skill and knowledge are jewels in times of prosperity, a sword and shield in times of adversity, and sure guides through times of uncertainty. So, of course, you know, the greatest... Uh, it's the treasure of all there is skill and knowledge, right? And they talk a lot about their, about, about skill, right? Like Yah has given us these gifts that we need to, you know, harness, that we need to be able to, you know, uh, refine and actually for the betterment of other people. So we all have gifts and talents. Are we using those to serve ourselves or the community around us? In the midst of material illusion, do not add to the confusion by acting falsely in word and deed. Be diligent and consistent in studying the wisdom contained within these books. Never forget the benefits that accure, accrue from a life well-led. And remember that whatever befalls is intended for your own good. If a man, establish yourself by your manliness. And if a woman, by your femininity. Be modest in manner and calm and bearing, for men avoid the excitable man who is a weak reed to lean upon in times of stress and a hazard in danger. The boastful man falls for, uh, far short of the image he intends to create. Think about that. Like a lot of people, like maybe with like they lack self confidence or whatever, they 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 know that with what they're saying is not who they truly are. They want to be that, and so they just boast about themselves, right? And people around them can see like clearly you're not the person you claim who you want us to think you are so a lot of people fall for it but uh, a lot of people can see through it you know uh, kind of like a, a a narcissist is uh you know really inside they're very paper thin 
you know, that they, they want to make it sound like they're very strong and all this, you know, knowledge or whatever it is, you know, but inside they're just paper. Uh, so uh, let's see. So weigh your words carefully for the spoken word cannot be recalled. A man careless with words is also unreliable in other ways. Never make a confident of one who babbles. Forget what has been done and cannot be altered and do not be concerned about things which may never happen. So there's some, you know, fear porn for you right there. It, just stop being concerned about all that stuff. You don't know if it's going to happen. If you have anything of value, keep it away from an envious man. Arise early in the morning and greet the day early for the sluggard and libed are already partially dead. <laughs> Eat and drink in moderation, taking sufficient for the well-being of the body without overloading it. Seek the company of those who are your superiors in wisdom, skill, and spirituality so that you will be raised up to prosper. Always be ready to heed advice and to accept instruction, bearing in mind that it is more profitable to listen than to talk. The man who cannot restrain his tongue rides a wild stallion. Keep it in check and avoid returning a hasty answer to those who say unkind things, which may stem only from their own weakness. So again, when, when people are saying, you know, unkind things to you, just right there, it says like, you just recognize they're a weak person. They're just weak. Don't return weakness with weakness. Just be strong. You don't need to, you don't need to strike back. You know, even if they disrespect you for not striking back, you know that they're a weak person. Okay. You're, you don't have to, you don't have to act like that. Be patient and forbearing under provocation and restrain your arm and tempted to raise it in anger. The man who remains unmoved under provocation is a better man than he who strikes. Always speak calmly and with few words. Speak softly and clearly. For only fools shout to cover their own ignorance. The ox bellows while the bull snorts. Let's see here. I think I'm going to, yeah, I got one more page. I think we're going to end on a chapter. Well, wow, the chapter one took a whole hour. <laughs> this is going to be a long study. But I hope you guys are enjoying this. A long read through. Take our time. One of the great failures of life is to lose a friend. If this misfortune befalls a man, he should search his heart carefully and sincerely lest it happen again. Never seek to maintain a friendship through hypocrisy or flattery, for this is no friendship, and it displays the double heart of a deceiver. Be proud, but not haughty. Straight talking, but not ins uh, insulting. Bold, but not aggressive. Patient, but not servile. Bear in mind that it is better for a man to be numbered among the insulted than among the insulters, among the slandered, and not among the slanders. Um, man, that's, that is such good advice there. I mean, there are so many, like nobody wants to be slandered, right? Um, and when these things happen, like you, one of the reactions is you want to strike back, right? And the fact is, is that in reality, especially on social media today, but it's probably always been this way, the person with the, the loudest voice with the megaphone, they're the ones that people listen to. It, it like people just say things just they make, they make stuff up. And then other people are like, is that true? Oh, I, you know, they're like, they like, they start, you know, they, you know, there's a, um, one of, Jack, I, I've said this many times, but one of Jack London's observations when he went up to Alaska, and he, as you guys know, he wrote a lot of stories about dogs, like uh, White Fang and um, Call of the Wild. And one of his observations was that he would watch dogs fight. So two dogs would go into the ring and fight, and the other dogs would surround them. And he, he noticed that when one dog gets flipped over on its back, it's over. That dog is dead. But more than the other dog killing that dog, all the other dogs would then, then attack the one that was on the ground. They didn't care who won. They, they were waiting you know, to be there. And, to, and we see that all the time when this, uh, this slander arises online. And you see all the people showing up for the fight. you know, And they're going to see who's going to fall on their back. right? And we're going to turn on that person. And it, but here he's saying, look, it's better to be when it comes to the health of your soul. Like this is about you and your journey, right? And you reclaiming your status as a son of Elohim. Do not be a slander. It is better to be slandered than be standing with the slanders. Be standing with the ring of people watching the fight and charging in to take it, take you out. It's better to be that person. Keep your feet firmly upon the great path of the true way, using moderation in all things as your guiding light. Never be effusive, effusive of speech or too friendly towards those who are no more than acquaintances. 
keep all at arm's length until they have established themselves for what they for what they are and their true natures are revealed. We could save ourselves from a lot of sorrows in life if we, you know, kind of keep to this. Uh, never allow the secrets of your heart to be handed at round as common property. Do not be oversensitive and ever ready to take offense, for this will only turn people against you. Never trespass upon the privacy of others and let all follow the paths of their inclinations. Attend to your own affairs and keep your thoughts from the affairs of others. In other words, mind your own business. Of thoughts, words, and deeds, only deeds have any established value on earth. Thoughts are intangible things in a world of matter, while words have no meaning unless translated into action. Now, this is good advice for all of you out there who have family and friends and other things who, uh, you know, I, I hear so often that, you know, nobody believe you know everyone's turned against me and all this kind of stuff and it's like it's like you know are you are you going in your family and just arguing doctrine and trying to wake them up and you know get them to you know realize you know all the things that we talk about you know 9 11 and you know sandy hook and you know the osama bin laden hoax and you know like you know i love to talk about the titanic hoax and the mud flood and the millennial kingdom the list goes on and on and on and they don't see it as you just argue and argue and argue with them like but if they what's more important here is your action your fruit right if you if you want to bring someone to the truth of torah instead of just arguing against the judaizer com, you know comments and all the things people throw at us like if they see a transformed life and see true joy, and you're not just pointing the fingers and they see that the Torah is a transformative document that is actually circumcising your heart and causing you to have love and joy and wanting to serve humanity. They're going to go, uh, if, if they are truly finding the most high and righteousness to be a beautiful thing, they're going to want that. If they don't want righteousness and the most high, then they're, they're not going to want that. And why argue with them? All right. So, uh, words need to be action and not the other way around. Goodness and wisdom should not be uh, secreted. For when their possessor cuts himself off from others, what purpose do they serve and how can they be measured and tested? The good man who fears co contamination by the world has no confidence in his goodness and renders no service. This is one of the things that Yochanan, the baptizer, criticized the... Um, we don't know if they were the Essenes, but it appears to be the Dead Sea uh, Scroll uh, Society. Uh, in the book of the Nazarene, he was living there amongst them. He was raised there, you know, with, with the white robe, uh, just like that they're described there. Um, the Essenes are described. And he criticized them. He said, you're good men. You're good men. But you are so afraid of being contaminated by the world that you don't go out into the world. And you don't actually, you know, you don't actually test yourself to see if you are truly good. You're living in an illusion of good. But you need to go out into the world and really test this out. And that was one of the things you can, you can uh, uh, criticize him for. And it's what it's being said right here. So, you know, being in solitude is not, you really don't know, right? You don't really know if you're a good person necessarily. And it, there might be right motives. Maybe you're trying to escape from the world, right? The evil world. But you can't, you know, completely, uh, if you're not using your talents to affect other people, then we're missing the point. If a man is found sinking into a morass of mud, he who tries to rescue him cannot be rescued by anyone standing off. The man who attempts to clean up the morals of the people is like the dusting cloth, which cleans only by becoming sold itself. All right, we are reading from Book of Wisdom. I had, I had to try to, re to get my head straight here because I was about to say Book of Britain, but we finished that last week and we only got a week into Book of Wisdom. Really quickly, for anyone who is tuning in for the first time because i'm going to get this question i'm going to ask where does book of wisdom come from this isn't in my bibles why am i not reading this so book of wisdom does have a bit of a mysterious uh, origins it derives from the colbrin the colbrin it's referred to as the colbrin bible i almost don't like to call it the colbrin bible because it's kind of a trigger for some people and, you know, obviously the writers weren't calling it the Colburn Bible, uh, but uh, it's getting a lot of attention. It's kind of building momentum. More people are looking into it and seeing some very interesting things. Now, we went through Book of Britain, and that was detailing Joseph of Arimathea or Yosef of Rama, 
coming over to Britain from Yehuda and with his sons and some of his Talmudim, uh, his associates, and bringing what we call Christianity to the Druids. In fact, the Druids were the first to embrace the faith. And it's a pretty epic read, tons of great stuff in it. It's like a mix between history and wisdom literature. And I just went blank. Um, yeah, Joseph Verimathia. And so anyways, the writers, they, they refer to him as the father of their faith. And the teachings seem to be stemming directly from him. Well, the same with Book of Wisdom. Very closely associated with Book of Britain, same language use, same kind of uh, par or, or proverbs, so to speak, wisdom literature. And of course, I should mention that if, for those of you who remember in Book of Britain, there's two whole chapters devoted to the teachings of Yehusha HaMashiach and some things he did there in Yehuda. And they're not sourcing the other Gospels. This is coming directly through uh, Yosef of Rama. And this book, of course, too, is closely associated with the Gospel of Kalaiti. For anyone who's read that, uh, you know, in our store, we have a version of it called Books, uh, Books of the Nazarene. So let's go ahead and get right into this. This is Chapter 2, The Dispensations of Life. If, if visited by affliction or sorrow, a man should not bewail his loss. For these should be the means of drawing him closer into the embrace of divinity. They are meant to strengthen his spirit and develop his spirituality. No man has any right to expect an untroubled life. And one who has passed half a year without trouble or affliction has already received ample reward for living and should not ask for more. Sorrow is the purging agents of the spirit and suffering the flux merging man with divinity. They also help to distinguish pure love from mock love, for pure love is the unquenchable fire, which the waters of tribulation cannot put out. Now, pause. I'll be pausing lots. Right? There's tons of stuff there. When we're talking about uh, divinity in this book, there's kind of two things happening. Okay, one is that we are talking about the great divine the father, the father of all Ruachoth, uh, and of course his son Yehusha HaMashiach, and and so on and so forth. You know, the father is the power. We went through that. I think it was last week in uh, Book of Britain where we saw all the threes, right? And um, but there's also the idea that the divine is that it's it's our purpose here on earth is to realize from once once we've come and where we're going. Right. And of course, there's two paths to take uh, the wide road and the, the narrow road. And of course, the, the wide road leads to destruction. The narrow road leads back to, uh, you know, it's leads to a point where we can claim to be the sons of Elohim. And that's the whole point of discovering the fact that we were the sons of Elohim at one time and we were stripped of that and we are here to reclaim it. We, could, we were here to, to push through all the lies, all the propaganda that is hurled on us from the moment we're born. And, you know, and it's a dedicated effort, as you guys know. It's just all distractions everywhere trying to keep us away from uh, what our test is, right, from passing the test. You know, we're getting nothing but wrong answers for the test, right, in the world around us. All right. And the other thing here is that is recognizing that when you have sorrow and chastisement and tribulation and trouble and all these things come upon you, recognize that this is for the the, ref, the refiner's fire, right? To purge your soul and to to turn you into uh, the person you're intended to be spiritually, right? And so when we come upon this stuff and we embrace it from that perspective. That's how we learn, right? But if we bemoan it, we're not going to learn anything. Um, and th over the last couple of weeks, I've been going through something very similar. Some of you, you guys know, I was on here Thursday night just talking about, um, you know, all these, you know, troubling times I've had. And through it all, I realized that, I mean, I knew what was happening. I saw what was happening when it came. And it was that y'all wanted to show me stuff. And I'm like, okay, what, what do you want to show me in all this? And when we're able to connect that to the divine, 
you see, then then we're able to, you know, able to learn. All right. All right. So and they're going to this whole chapter is going to be talking about this. A man should always be prepared for testing and never be caught off guard for calamity may will strike in the midst of prosperity and peace. He should also bear in mind while undergoing his test that at any time it may be eased by a stroke of good fortune. After every calamity, a man should review the words he has spoken and the things he has done, for perhaps what has befallen him is only the result of incautious words or the outcome of foolish deeds. All right, pause right there. One of the biggest things I've seen when people come into the what we call the Torah movement, and by that you, you recognize that there are these five books in the front of your Bible that were our eternal commands, instructions in righteous living that we have been taught our entire lives, not by the Bible, but by uh, the lies and the propaganda and the controllers and, you know, that are over us, right? The thorns and the, the NCPs and whatever you want to call them, telling us to disobey them. That is actually Yah's will that we disobey the commands he gave us and that it's, you know, Satan's will that we obey them. It, everything is inverted, right? So what happens is, is that when people come over to this and they, 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 they start realizing, they, they read in there that Yahuwah says, I place before you a blessing and a curse. And it's up to you to choose the blessing or the curse. And then they live these lives that are just these cursed lives, like the result of curses. And they're like, why am I not receiving the blessing? Like, you know, and, you know, I, de I deserve to receive the blessing. And it's like, actually, no, you don't. Um, but one thing that people don't realize here is that many people in Christianity even though they they've been lied to and they've been told not to obey the you know the laws because if you do you're spitting on the cross you've heard it all right it's you know that you're a Jew a Judaizer all these things you've heard all the excuses uh, but they still have these these hearts that are these circumcised hearts where they truly desire to live a life of blessing and they 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 make wise decisions. They set themselves up financially, you know, while other people were out partying in their 20s and going seeing cold playing concert and, you know, blowing all their money and, you know, doing all this stuff. They're not doing that and they're saving it and they're investing in real estate and all these different things. Right. They're building a business uh, and they're working with their hands. And then by the time they're later in life in their 40s and their 50s and they have a family and they have children, it, you see that this idea of the blessing, you see that they are living a fruitful life. And and so it's you know it's it's a cause and effect, right? They they were choosing the maybe the blessing, they didn't even realize the language use in the Torah. Whereas these other people, they you know, living these lives of you you can name it. I don't need to go through it all. And now they're wondering, well, where's my slice of the pie? And it's like, well, you know, it, it, this actually comes down to the work of your hands and your dedication and this kind of stuff. It doesn't just fall in your lap. Nobody's entitled to that. All right. So what it's saying here is that, you know, you need, when you fall on bad times, instead of pointing the finger at other people and going, well, that person, all those people must be to blame. Maybe it's a good chance for you to go, what have I done to cause this? You know, what, what can I change? In my, what am I trying to be taught here that I am being chastised for in my past you know, maybe I ate too much bacon or something, you know, maybe, I ate, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, and uh, it, I talk about this a lot, too. I, I know I'm going on a rant here, but uh, when, when I get into a lot of um, I'll say it, I'm going to lose I'm going to lose viewers over this. But when I get into a lot of charismatic group, uh, charismatic people, they have this big thing about being able to heal people. And, you know, they'll say things like nobody is supposed to be sick. Yah doesn't want anybody to be sick and that we need to come and heal you. We need to lay hands on you and heal you. And it's like, well, wait a second. Wait a second. Aside from the whole, you know, when you understand germ theory and you understand that uh, actually uh, detoxing is a good thing. So when you're detoxing and you're sick, it's actually instead of trying to, you know, put a Band-Aid over that and trying to cover up your 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 unhealthy lifestyle. How about we, we deal with the unhealthy lifestyle that's causing the disease that is now causing, you know, bringing out these symptoms of sickness? Hopefully you guys all understand me. Now, one of the discussions I've had with a lot of these, uh, you know, health charismatics, 
is okay. So you you get like um somebody with like I don't know diabetes or you know some disease, and it's because of their lifestyle, how they're eating or whatever. Maybe someone's just eating junk food all day, and so they're getting the uh, the repercussions of this. They are living the curse now, and they're like, I need to be healed of this, and so. You're like, yes, definitely. And you lay hands on them and like, you know, heal this person's disease. And and Yaz kind of, I think, sitting there going, well, wait a second. This guy's not repenting. He's going right back to the potato chips. You know, he's going right back to the, you know, just the, the sugar and all this kind of, you know, all these things that are killing the guy. And so are you asking me to heal this guy repeatedly every single day while he lives his life? And so it, this is why, you know, th this is a theme we're going to see in this book that it's, it's all about, you know, it's up to you. All right. You're the ones that are making the decisions for your health, uh, health of your spirit and your body. And of course they're separate, but they're interconnected. So um, a, a physically poor body may reflect a physically poor spirit and vice versa. All right. Chastisement is a, we're on verse three still. Chastisement is a necessity of earthly life. If it did not follow a wrongdoing, how could a child ever learn the difference between right and wrong? The chastisements of men spring from divine love alone. It springs from, I sounded like a robot there, I think. It springs from divine love alone. For through suffering comes sympathy and through tribulation comes understanding. The man who can cheerfully accept affliction, knowing its true purpose, is one who has learned one of the deepest secrets of life. No man is afflicted beyond his endurance, for the cold blasts of calamity are always tempered to his weakness. Only the strong and chosen are called upon to carry the heavy burdens, for the strong runner does not care if the wind is against him. And... Um, I'm going to read the next verse because I may get ahead of myself here, but I love that. Just put a, a bookmark on that there, that the, the strong runner does not care if the wind is against him. And this is what you see, you know, um, oops, I got a little itch here on my cheek. Uh, this is what you see in, you know, the people who are successful in life, right? Where they are able to overcome all the obstacles, everything that comes at them. They just, they, they see it as a hurdle that needs jumped over and they do it and they do it and they do it. And then, you know, these other people are just, you know, the wind blows them over, right? They just did like, ah, oh, I can't do this. And, you know, the calamities of life are too much. I'm just going to throw in the towel and give up. And then they sit around complaining about it. If trials and tribulations descend upon a man, he should meet them with quiet resolution and courage. It is useless to rage against them or seek to rise in revolt against his lot. Only the faint hearted and ignorant are turned from the path because they think their endurance may be in vain. That is so key, and I want to focus on that. The righteousness and goodness of a man will not protect him from suffering and may even add to it, all right? So if you are actually living a good and righteous life, you may have more suffering. And, of course, the suffering, that turns many people away, right? Uh, and let me read this line again. Only the faint-hearted and ignorant are turned from the path because their endurance may – because they think – their endurance may be in vain. Since I have been in the ministry, I have seen this constantly. People from this group who have walked away and, they, you know, I'll, people won't come to this group for like two or three months and I'll write them and be like, hey, what happened to you? And they're like, yeah, I walked away from the faith. And, you know, I just, I, I, I realized it wasn't true. It was all fake or whatever. And this is one of the reasons that I, I say constantly that if you, if you want an out, there's no shortage of outs. And the Torah itself, when you start obeying the commands and you're trying to live a righteous set apart life, is very dangerous ground to be on. What I mean by that is that it, Revelation makes it clear that he's, all, he's at war with the, with the set apart. So if you are declaring to obey the commands, you are declaring open war against Hasatan. And he is declaring, or you could say he is declaring war at you. He is going to get you to, he's, everything in his power to get you to walk away. And he can only do that if you don't guard the commands, right? And you're kind of going in carefree and boom, and he takes you out. And uh, what happens is, is as people try to get closer to the most high, there's like that, there's like a pruning that happens and they just start getting cut out. 
And we see that you just start cutting out the fat. People keep falling away and falling away and falling away. We see it like on all the feast seasons where people just fall away and fall away. And there's these attacks and all these things that happen. Uh, so uh, that being said, right, you know, it only the strongest are going to get closer and closer and closer down that, that narrow path and actually succeed. You know, and um, it's almost like, you know, like if, if anyone has ever gone to the gym, you know how like you get some people at the gym and they're just like they're just ripped and, you know, they're in front of the mirror, you know, kissing themselves as they lift the you know weights and stuff. But they they've been there. They've been toning this body. And then you see other people at the gym and they've been there for like five years and they still look the exact same as when they started. And, you know, it's like kind of like, what are you doing here? You know, and it, it's kind of like that in the faith. Right. Where, you know, it some people are in and they just they don't build the muscle. They don't, they don't, they don't get stronger. They just, they're going to fall away. I, I shouldn't say they're going to fall away, but you know, it's like, what are you doing? Right. What, what are you doing in this walk? If you're not actually attuning your mind attuning your spirit and getting stronger, the righteousness and goodness of man will not protect him from suffering and may even add to it. As I mentioned, the fruits of his labor are not plucked along the road, which lies on the side of the border. How often is a man seen bewailing his misfortune and so sorry for himself that he fails to gain any benefit from it? All too often, men take their misfortunes as a sign that they are abandoned. And um, think about uh, Job, right? Like he was the opposite. He, he, everyone came to him and like, yeah, you know, you've been abandoned. This is proof that uh, Yah doesn't love you. Just you're a sinner. Give up now. You know, kiss your butt goodbye. And um, he was able to obviously endure. I mean, that whole paragraph paragraph right there describes the book of Job. Men set their hearts on certain things and make plans for their attainment. But unless the plans they make complement the divine plan, they will come to nothing. And this is, you know, what we read that it, what Yaakov or James would say, you know, don't say uh, that I will, you know, don't promise something. Say if Yah um ordains it, right? If it's in his will, I will do these things. Earth has a mission and everything upon it is there to play its part in the fulfillment of that mission. Material ends have little importance besides spiritual ends and creation is only intended to satisfy spiritual needs and develop spiritual abilities. So if you have things in your life that are not uh, maintaining your spiritual needs or helping you grow, then you know, don't be afraid to give it to goodwill. The good and the wicked are tested and no one is exempt. The difference is that the righteous man uses the test to benefit himself, while an unrighteous turns them against himself to destroy his own soul. No man should be overwhelmed by the troubles and tribulations which come upon him. They are intended to be utilized for the benefit of his soul and the strengthening of his spirit. And bearing this in mind, he should be better able to endure them. And so think about the whole, you know, rapture crowd out there and how, you know, oh, we can't bear the tribulation and all these things, and they're not intended for us. And they would say God would never intend his children to go through these hard times. And so, you know, we need to be raptured out of here. And it's like, it's like, you guys are completely missing the point to us being in this world. All of this chastisement is here to beautify our spirits and make us more like the image of, the, of uh, Elohim. Every man is born to be tested and tried. Sorrow and suffering, problems and tribulations are meant to be the lot of men. Yet they are, so think about that. That was the will from the beginning on this earth, the will of Elohim on this earth. Yet they are never his continued lot, and the brighter moments of life far outweigh the darker. I mean, I hope you guys can say that's true. It, it certainly is for me. Man was not given life for the sole purpose of enjoying earth and its pleasures. Earth is a place man must cultivate and prepare for harvest, and what he produces will be his uh, sustenance when the season is ended. Tribulation is his plow and trouble his spade. Sorrow and suffering are his seeds. And the joys of life, the fertilizing waters. I think it said in other places, we might have read in Book of Britain, that uh, the, the difference between a righteous man and a, you know, uh, a, wicked, uh, a wicked person is that a, 
a non-righteous person, or you can say a wicked person, looks out at the world and is unsatisfied with it because they it, it's a place of trouble and it doesn't satisfy their needs, you see. Whereas a, a righteous person understands that the world is here to chastise us and to strengthen us and test us. And, you know, you see the world as perfect, exactly as it was intended to. And if you start seeing it as imperfect, then those things maybe are leading you in the wrong direction in your life. And those are the, that's the stuff you need to get rid of. Be grateful for the good things of life, for they far exceed your needs. Offer a prayer of thanks in the morning and another in the evening. And if you can find no reason for doing so, be certain. I love this part. Be certain the fault lies within yourself. Even to know that the worst possible thing has happened and the cup of mis misfortune been drained to its last drop brings a strange compensation. For there is a deep peace of mind known only to those who have lost all and cannot lose more. I was in that exact spot back in 20, early 2016. And I'll never forget that moment when we were driving across the country in our fifth wheel with our young toddler uh, boys, a uh, twin, young, young twin toddler boys. And we basically, we lost everything. I mean, we lost, we lost all of our finances. It was all gone. Bank accounts wiped. And, and it was kind of like, how are we going to even feed our, our children tomorrow because we don't even have money for food anymore and we happen to be in charleston south carolina of all places and this is where Yah told us to park it right at this spot and we're like okay and we stayed here we haven't left but i remember we were on an old slave plantation and this the 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 big house the master's house was still there it was never burned down and you could, there was a, we were camping there. There was a, it was beautiful estate. There was a, a, a like a slave, uh, the original uh, graveyard is still there. And I was, we were parked right next to the, the road that the slaves would take every day out to the right, the rice paddies or the, you know, out there to, to pick the rice. And I just went walking down this road uh, that the slaves came and went every day. And we had nothing. And I remember being so relieved and just praising Yah and just thanking him and, and just saying, you know, I am, I am nothing. I am worthless. You know, I, I'm just, I'm a nobody. And it is your total right to give to, to us and to take it all away. And that, that moment, I think, was where Yah's like, okay, I can work with you now. You know, I've taken it all away. And you realize your lack of worth, you know, and I can work with you. All right. Uh, let's see. Where, where do we leave off? Um, let me just read the last of this paragraph. Even to know that the worst thing has happened and the cup of misfortune been drained to its last drop. Okay. Yeah. Brings a strange compensation for there's a deep peace of mind known only to those who have lost all and cannot lose more. If a man is favored with prosperity, he should be vigilant, lest it permit his desires to lead him astray and his spiritual diligence be diminished. In the greater scheme of things, the times of affliction and adversity are not to be feared so much, for then men incline towards spiritual things. It is in times of prosperity, when they acquire wealth and become conceited and self-centered, that the danger lies. For then they twist the commanding words and austere meanings of the sacred books and pervert them to console their own conscience. Therefore, in times of prosperity and contentment, a man must be more careful in the interpretation of the sacred books than he would be when he only turned to them for strength and consolation. This is, you know, obviously one of the reasons why Yahushua says that, you know, he talks about the, you know, the eye of the needle and the camel, that you know, very few rich people are going to make it into the kingdom. And if you, of course, read the complementary gospel with this, the Gospel of Kaleidi or Books of Nazarene, Yahushua says, uh, he says, it's not evil being rich. He's like, you can be rich and enter the kingdom. But the idea is, is that you need to realize that everything you have is there for the betterment of humanity, for your spirit, as well as those around you. So it's like, look, if you if you if you're prosperous as a businessman, use that to 
get employees and pay them, right? And take care of their needs and, you know, use other stuff to give to the poor and the hungry. And uh, there was one example. Um, so he said, like, you know, we need, there will always be poor people. There will always be hungry people. And we need people who are wise with their money and successful to be able to take care of them. And of course, this is a test on all sides for the poor and the rich. And there was a one rich man who came up to him and then said, you know, like, I, I give all my things to the poor. And what do I need to do to attain salvation? He's like, you're good to go. Sounds like you're doing great. And the poor and the rich man says, yeah, well, I'm sick and tired of giving my money to the poor. When is this going to stop? When are they going to be well, like the poor people keep coming and I, like I'm getting tired of it. And he's like, well, then if you want to enter the kingdom. You better just get rid of all your money now and live as a poor man because you're not going to make it with that attitude. All right. It is in times of prosperity when they acquire wealth and become conceited and self-centered that the danger lies for then they twit. Okay. We read that. And uh, sounds like a, a, the American experience, really, if you think about it, you know, Western Christianity, uh, how they've twisted the, the books so that they've made it out. So like, as I said earlier, that it's Yah's will that you don't obey his commands. And uh, they, they, there's just a, there's a, for those of us who have been coming down this journey and we look back at the people we've left behind and we see that they're in the same place, they haven't grown. And there's just they're, they're, like we didn't realize it when we were there with them, but we see how gutted they are. Like just there's there's something not right with them. And, you know, they just don't have a desire to uh, to grow spiritually. And they might be very well off financially or all these different things living in the world. And they look at you like you're the weird one. You're the strange one. You're the one that's, you know, going against, you're, you've lost it. And you're the one that's going against the will of the father by obeying his commands, right? It's all backwards. The intelligent man observes the ways of nature and the forces she utilizes. He learns how they operate so that he does not become the slave of blind forces beyond his control. Those who do, do not understand the working of natural forces or are over, overawed by them become their slaves. This is a place where nothing is seen clearly, and even truth could be distinguished only against a background of contrasting falsity. I love that last line because they're saying that um, that we I, we I think we're reading in Britain, Book of Britain, where the the you know all truth emanates down from uh, Elohim above, the Father of all, Ruachoth. But down here in this material realm, you know, there's just these nothing but an onslaught of lies that are trying to bury the truth and disguise it. And so, I mean, this, this, exp it seems to exp here at, at TUC and all the discussions we have, this line seems to uh, really uh, show, like, I think like our very conversations when he says that even truth can be distinct, distinguished only against a background of contrasting falsity, because all we do is we look out through the media and all these things, and it's just lies, 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 lies. And we're like, Where's the truth in all this, right? I love that line. The dispensations of life are not entirely beyond the understanding of man, and indeed he has a duty to strive for understanding. Everything serves a purpose, even things which seem the most hurtful. So remember that when, I mean, you're just like cutting, you know, the knife cut into the gut, and you're like, this is the most awful feeling that I could imagine you know, to stop and go, what am I supposed to learn in this? You know, what, what is, what is, everything has a purpose. Everything has a purpose. And where is this leading me or supposed to lead me? And am I going in the right direction? Every, um, every ungainly rock has within itself a potential statue and potential beauty lies in every block of wood or lump of clay but what is there cannot come out of its own volition. Now, I have to wonder if, if if this quote is original to this book or if it came from other places. This is something that C.S. Lewis commented upon. And if you guys ever saw um, the movie Shadowlands, which was based on uh, him marrying Joy Grisham late in life, and then she dies of cancer. And, of course, C.S. Lewis started out as an atheist. You know, he came over to Christianity. And it, it was so trying what he went through when his wife and they were together, like not long. I mean, I think they got married when she was already sick 
and he he married her just to take care of her like he was it wasn't like a sexual thing like he married her just because he wanted to care of her and it was so trying on him i think he considered becoming an atheist again like he was really struggling with all of this and he had a great quote where he was talking about how uh where all these uh these rocks these imperfect rocks that you see but within every single one of them is this beautiful statue and so yeah, he wants to make us into this beautiful sculpture, you know, that that would be the divine, right? Like the, the sons of Elohim, right? And so, but it hurts, right? He's got to get the chisel and the hammer out and just bang, 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 bang. Or, you know, however they did this in the ancient world, right? You guys know what I'm talking about. But it hurts. And where they're kicking and screaming and stop it, you know, and, and a lot of people, they don't allow him to do it. And he's not going to do it if we don't allow him. But recognizing that if we're going through all these terrible situations, it's because he wants to make us into this beautiful image. And we have to we have to just remind ourselves of that and, you know, and just embrace the storm or as, you know, the, the strong runner going against the wind. Right. Not get knocked over by it. Uh the image and the beauty are brought out only after the untouched materials have been subjected to the discipline of thoughts and the forming action of chisel, knife, or fire. So that's, well, <laughs> it actually just talked about fire for, uh, uh, for stone cutting. Just, you know, kind of throw that out there. Now, that could be a, a reference to blacksmith work, but, you know, the context was stone. So, and we've talked about lasers and, you know, 3D printers and that kind of stuff. According to the good things done by a man, so will he be rewarded. And by the nature of the evil he does, so will he be punished. A man is paid according to his labor, and idle hands make a hungry mouth. So maybe that's something, you know, to ask yourself the next time you're really hungry and think, just, it's, just, it's just worth asking. Is there something I was doing, you know, kind of like idle work that I don't have the money now to buy this food, you know? Should I blame other people for that? Or, you know, maybe that's something I should have been a little bit more proactive at. All right. Chapter chapter three, the harmonious life. Whatever is wrong on earth is wrong with man. The discord among men comes from within themselves and not from their environments. And it is in his relationship with others that man displays his deficiencies and weakness most clearly. They keep saying the same thing over and over again. It's like, it keeps saying, look, the problem is not with nature. Stop blaming nature. All right. So... If you're having, you know, discord amongst other men, it's start with within yourself. Don't look out there. Don't look at the hurricane. Don't look at the, the fires, that sort of stuff. It's all in here. And interestingly enough, you know, the if you read like Third Baruch, we've gone over a lot of those passages. It, it says the same thing. It says like these things happen because of men's lack of worship, their lack of, you know, spiritual development. Maybe they're, you know, they're committing adultery and, and murder and, you know, fornication all these things is causing famines and you know go on and on and on and so again it'd be the same thing from a hebrew perspective that you got to look within yourself these things are happening because of what's going on in here not out there and i and by the way for, you know as we go through like all the the, the the weather wars out there and you talk about how all these hurricanes and fires are done by you know governments weapons all that kind of stuff I would still say the same, though. I would still say that if mankind were righteous and they were not living lives of sins and wickedness and disobedience, that these things could not prevail. So the same still applies. The, um, hypocrisy is one of the most deep-rooted evils in the natures of men, for they hate in others the things they fear in themselves. So uh, maybe a, a better word for that would be projecting. Most people, they just they project. So that the things they accuse others of is ultimately something they actually hate within themselves. And they want to disguise that. They don't want you to know that's who they truly are. And they, they, they push it on other people. The man who is the most vo uh, voluble against a particular form of vice is the man who practices, practices it in secret. Men wrap themselves in a mantle of hypocrisy and never uncover their real selves. They declare themselves for or against they say they believe one thing or the other. They like this or that, but rarely do they declare themselves truthfully or reveal their true thoughts and feelings to others. To overcome this evil, this wickedness in men is one of mankind's greatest battles. 
to this, the good religion must dedicate itself. And I'm speaking just to the, the Torah community this time. I have never seen so much hypocrisy in all my life as when I came over to these communities that say they're keeping Yah's commands. And I have encountered, now there's many good people in here, many people who have, you have people who have really good intention and maybe they're, they're not kind of getting it right. Or you have people who are really devoted to it and they're to live it out. And they're, they're, you know, what you see is what you get, but there is a huge uh, abundance of hypocrisy of people who, I would say a lot of these people are the Torah terrorist and they're projecting onto you really how horrible they are as people. And they just, they want you to keep the commands. They want you to keep a certain calendar. Um, I'll, I'll say this, I'll probably lose some viewership over this, but whether or not the lunar Sabbath is correct or incorrect, when you get into the calendars, I have never met so many people who demand that you keep their calendar and they don't keep it themselves. I have rarely ever met a lunar Sabbath person who ever keeps the lunar Sabbath. And I'm serious about that. I interviewed a lot of people. I'm like, do you actually keep this? And they're like, oh, I got to work a job. I wish I could. Then I'm like, well, why are you online telling everyone else they will not have the, uh, the blessings of Yah, that they are not saved or whatever, because they're not keeping it. You just want them to keep it, but you don't want to keep it. This is the hypocrisy I'm talking about, like this level. And it's really bad. And it's everywhere. I went to one household and they're, they're telling us that Yah will never bless us until we keep their Sabbath, the, the lunar Sabbath. And then I'm finding out that they're going to like school and, you know, all this kind of stuff. I'm, I'm like, what? Like, that doesn't, whatever. So the, this is this everywhere. It's so prevalent and it's so bad. It's not just a calendar issue. It's in a lot of other things as well. Uh, men wrap themselves in a mantle of hypocrisy and never uncover their real selves. They declare themselves for or against. They say they believe one thing or the other. They like this or that, but rarely do they declare themselves truthfully or reveal their true thoughts and feelings to others to overcome. Okay, we already read this. And uh, I would just say to that one more time that um, you know, a lot of people, you know, they surround themselves with people who tell them things, you know, they want to hear. And um, yeah. All right, moving on. Those who follow the good religion should seek their friends among others of similar belief and inclination. And they should not try to walk a double road. And that makes total sense. You can't walk the, the narrow road and the wide road at the same time. If you're on the narrow road, you're only going to find people of, uh, of a similar lifestyle, right? The people pursuing the same thing. And uh, anyone who, if you're trying to befriend people on the wide road, they're just, all they're going to do is try to get you onto the wide road. That's all they're going to try to do. They're going to fill you with distractions and the cities of vanity and, and so on and so forth. Uh, no man can hide a thing within his breast forever. And if he is a secret hypocrite, su hypo hypocrite, someday it will be made known. Everything will be made manifest. You can't hide this stuff. Nothing done, known, or experienced during earthly life is lost forever. If your neighbor offend you, then restrain your anger so that your spirit may be benefited. Burdens borne patiently and with courage and insults ignored are better for the spirit than any form of penance. Always restrain your anger for the sake of neighborly harmony. But for your own good, remember that the words of an angry man are like glowing embers in his mouth. Anger alone does, not, does no great harm to the spirit, but anger with malice or hatred certainly blemishes the purity of a soul. Never try to appease a man in the hour of his anger, but leave him to be consumed in his own fire. Before you vent your anger on a man who has offended you, pause and try to discover some goodness in him, which you lack. That's like the hardest thing to do, too. You know, you just want, you just want to villainize somebody, right? It is not required that a person never gets angry or becomes stirred up inside for sometimes. Circumstances demand the response of righteous anger. Therefore, be one slow to anger and with complete mastery over the temper, rather than one without the ability to be stirred to anger. I mean, obviously, you can't, if it's like not controlled, you know, and you're going to one of those like Viking rages, probably not righteous anger at that point. Do not be too sweet unless you want to be eaten. 
<laughs> That's a, that should be on a fortune cookie right there. Do not be too sweet unless you want to be eaten. When two persons quarrel in anger, both are always in the wrong. The most burdensome person in any community is the one who will not do what he's capable of doing because he cannot do the things he wants to do. Every man must learn the difference between the little things he can do alone and the greater things, which can be done with the cooperation of others, for unity bestows strength. Also, the person in the community, the weakest person in the community, who does not do what he's supposed to do is, as I've mentioned before, is typically the guy who's just complaining about everybody else and how, you know, he's got the martyrdom complex and it's all your fault and nobody takes care of me and I'm a brother and we're all on the tour and you guys are all hypocrites. And then, you know, he's, he's like projecting all this on other people. And he's like, you know, this individual doesn't lift a finger, pretty much. The most, um, all right, let's see. Always, verse six, always be generous in your dealings with the neighbor and bear in mind that as water quenches fire, so does cheerful restitution atone for a wrong. When a neighbor greets you cheerfully, answer him in the same manner. For a surely face or a frown frightens away the hand of friendship. So don't be... <laughs> Yeah. Don't be frowning at people. Generosity and kind heartedness are excellent qualities, but those who possess them should be vigilant, for it is not inconceivable that the goodness they do may sometimes result in more evil than good. And so, you know, this is like maybe a way to say this is like empowering people, you know, uh, entitlers and people who are. Uh, very generous of themselves with others and then other people like leeches it could be family it could be it could be your children it could be you know you know people who are like abusive and other things and they just come in and they just they live off that and you're actually enabling them to do more evil right and that's that's what it's saying like that's where your generosity needs to stop you need to make sure that you're not allowing people to continue their uh, lifestyle by you know how you provide for them always treat the property of your neighbor or his friends as you would wish your own property and friends to be treated never speak without thought for words cannot be recalled and things said many may remain beyond recall forever you know those things you said in a conversation that you wish you wouldn't or somebody else says something and you never forget it right and there's always that that phrase that was said between you and he and you can't ever forget it a lightly spoken word may ruin a life or destroy the contentment of a family. The guiding rule is not only to say the right thing in the right place, but also to leave unsaid the wrong thing at the moment when it is most tempting to utter it. This is why you want to have righteous anger and not just anger, anger. This is the rule of conversation. Is it true? Is it instructive? Is it kind? Is it necessary? Do not be crude in speech or rough in manner, for these reveal a hidden weakness. Courtesy, consideration, and good manners are necessary ingredients in the cements of neighborliness. The cement of friendship is mutual suffering. A man should never talk to a woman in a manner which would outrage her modesty, but common women have sacrificed their modesty and cannot be outraged. Therefore, the manner of a man's speech in the presence of a woman Pay attention to this. The manner of a man's speech in the presence of a woman indicates his opinion of her and her reputation. Always be vigilant when in the company of women, for no greater insult can be offered to a man that, than to imply that his wife, mother, daughter, or sister is a common woman. A strong man can afford to be gentle and quiet wherever he is, but a weak man must be rough and boastful to boost himself. The man who's always boosting himself is certainly one who needs boosting. I'm going to refrain on comment on that last part because I think it talks about more about how to treat women and how, how you actually treat a woman, like your wife or your daughter or your sister or anybody's, any other woman is actually how you, how you view them. And it's, that's, they'll talk more about it. If someone, uh, if some misfortune has befallen a neighbor or he is out of favor with the rulers, he will be suffering the miseries of shame and therefore to visit him under these circumstances might add to it. It is a matter of discretion and tact as to when he should be visited. 
Whatever he has done, treat him with kindness and consideration. The fruits of kindness are sweet, but the fruits of hatred and malice lie heavily on the stomach. As surely as night follows day, as a man deals with others, so will he uh, be dealt with. If a man does not wish his own possessions to be touched, he should show the same respect for the possessions of another man. That makes sense. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? Likewise, if he respects his own reputation and expects others to respect it also, he should hold the reputation of others in the same high regard. And by the way, when they use the word respect, later on in this book, they talk about pride. Uh, I would almost uh, like to insert the word respect into pride because, you know, pride is such a native connota uh, connotation of, you know, pride being puffed up and, and you know, in a place of blindness. Um, and I, I don't believe that's what they're talking about when we get to pride a little bit later on. If he does not wish to become the sub subject of gossip, he should not gossip about anyone else. As a man expects his own home and family to be treated, so should he treat the home and family of another. As he cherishes the good name of his wife and the welfare of his children, so should he cherish the good name of another's wife and the welfare of his children. Of course, if you want to incite the, the wrath of any man, talk about his, his wife, talk about his mother, talk about any woman that's close to him, right? And this is what we talked about, the, the unforgivable sin and the blasphemy of the Ruach HaKadosh. And when you realize the Ruach HaKadosh is the mother, right? You're like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, like Yahuwah, you know, he... Uh, you know, or you say, or the father, our father in heaven be like, look, you know, we can get, a, we can disagree on a lot of things and, uh, you know, we can get into those skiffs and I could chastise you and you could get all, you know, hissy fit at me over it, but you disrespect, you know, the Ruach HaKadosh, we're going to have some serious issues here. Like you're in contempt of court, you're going to be leaving and we don't want to be in that position. Deal charitably with your neighbors, and wherever the opportunity to do good arises, do not hesitate to do it. However, a single act of charity means that the heart has been stirred only once. It may just it may be just a sudden urge that passes, and charity is a continuing process. Actually, charity, uh, the way it was described in the books of the Nazarene, is Yahushua says, like, if you... If you're basically, you're eating food at a table and you have these leftovers and you're like, oh, let's take these scraps and let's feed the poor with it, right? I, I remember um, when one of my first jobs, I worked at a coffee house and it was great that, I'm not complaining, it was great that they did this. But, you know, every single night we would have a, like a, uh, you know, bakery items, muffins, scones, that kind of stuff. And they couldn't be left there for the next day because the fresh delivery was coming the next morning. And so we had to box it up and we would take it to like a donation center for the homeless. And they would pat themselves, you know, on the back and pride themselves. Look at us. We're taking care of the poor. It's like, no, actually, you would be throwing that out and you're just doing that, you know. But what Yahushua is, is saying is that like true charity is actually you're losing something so something someone else can have something. So here's an example. Let's say as a family, you're on a really tight budget. These are tough times. And you budget to actually buy a pizza for your family. Now, of course, as you guys know, pizzas don't come cheap anymore, right? They used to be like, you know, like poor man's food. You know, actually, they were, actually I think pizza was designed in the Great Depression. They were called pizza pies because they were like a pie that, you know, was like, you know, they made them on the go and they could hand out slices to people on the street. It was really cheap. Now they're really expensive. So it would be like you walking out of a, a, a pizza parlor with your pizza for your family that you're really looking forward to. And you've budgeted your money for this. And then you see a family right there standing out there in the in the, the rain or the, the, the hot sun or whatever. And, you know, whether they have no food and they're hungry and you walk up to them and say, you know, we're renting this for our family. Are you hungry? Would you like food? And they're like, yes. That we were really hungry and you give it to them and then you tell your family well i guess we're not having pizza tonight i mean that that right there is like true charity right it, it, it has to be an actual sacrifice and as they say here it's a continuing process not just a one-time event like that that will that will show if i mean your, your heart can be moved temporarily but if it truly has a lasting effect on you it's gonna be something it's an ongoing thing of self-sacrifice 
A man can find peace and happiness in his home only when his wife and family have it, and these things cannot be portioned out. The man with strife at home has a lot more misery than that of a hungry dog. When a guest bear in mind that the ways of a host are always right in the eyes of the guest. So what it's saying is, is when you go into someone's home, don't be the problem. Don't be the person complaining about this and that and looking for things. And, you know, it's like, it's like, yeah, don't be the strife to this guy. He's actually opening his home for you and his ways are right. Always live according to your beliefs. For to do otherwise is hypocrisy. One of the tasks of the good religion is to teach men that they have to bridge the gap between what they believe to be right and the way they live. Also, though many men know how they should live, very few do, in fact, live that very way. The biggest, one of the biggest cognitive dissonance I've ever seen is in Christianity. And let me explain. A lot of Christians, when you when it comes down to it and you talk to them about the commands, the Torah, they don't have a hard time seeing the benefit in it. They're like, they're like, yeah, I, I see that. You you can even show them how how in First John he defines sin. He says sin is a transgression of the law. So if you break any piece of this law, you are living in sin. You have sinned or are living in sin. And they'll go, they'll go, yeah, but um, I can't keep it anyway, so I'll try. Or something like that, you know, and be like, this is too hard to do it. Or, yeah, I see that, but I don't have to because I've got the license to sin now, right? I've got freedoms in Christ, right? And this is this is it right here. That's, that's the cognitive dissonance. They don't get it. I mean, they, on one hand, they see that there is a righteous way. But on the other, they say, well, I don't have to live that way to be declared righteous, right? Like, I can I can live different a different lifestyle than what is advocated to be believed in scripture and that's a that's a huge like it's like a moose size headache of cognitive dissonance talking to people and trying to get them to see that and they just they, sometimes they just can't see it and this is our goal in life to get to that point to refine the, the our soul always live across, okay though it is proper for a man to marry early it is not right to marry with undue haste for a man to take a wife before he can support her or before he can understand her, is foolishness. The man who takes a wife in unwise haste ties a millstone around his own neck and can blame none but himself for the consequences. A man should never take a wife until he has read through the sacred books many times. Now, in my case, I, I can say that I did not read through the, the sacred books many times, um, and I did marry early. And uh, it, we both believe it was well. We've we felt he called us into it and it was, it was great. And we, we could barely even support ourselves at the time. And we were so poor. Uh, we were, you know, paying for rent out of a garage that didn't even have a bathroom in it, but there was never a day that went by that we ever complained about it. We just loved, we loved every minute of it. But that would break a lot of people. Um, I think we did it because we felt a calling from our father saying, we want, I want you to marry each other. And we did it. And so we were obedient, but uh, for most people, yeah, something you, what we read, I think it was last week is like, um, it said before you marry a woman, pay a lot of attention to her or, you know, uh, observe, you know, her faults, pay attention to her faults. After you marry her, uh, you know, stop paying attention to her faults, right? Because it's always the opposite. Before we marry people, it's all like, we're like, you know, it's all gushy love and all oh, you're so perfect. And then after you marry them, it's like, you know, blah, 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 blah. And just attacking, and accusing each other. And then, you know, you get divorced and so on and so forth. Stand firm in your belief as to what is right and what is wrong. Never surrender your principles or betray your ideals. Yet do not let your mind become bigoted or prejudiced. For the man of unchanging mind is as water, which standing still becomes stagnant and filled with slime. This was my whole problem with the Christian church. It was stagnant water. It was just, you never went anywhere. You just, you interpreted everything in the Bible according to 13 books of Paul uh, the epistles uh, of Paul, and it was just, you, you didn't see growth. People had questions. They were never answered. You asked, like, what about the Sabbath day? And you never got a good answer, you know, and it's just, it was stagnant. 
His thoughts are like water in prison within a vase until it becomes foul. And of course, you know, the, the difference between a person who Yah can work with versus not is if you're a vase that's filled with water, you know, you're probably puffed up, pr proud, whatever, ignorant, don't care, can't work with that, right? We need to be empty, right? So he can fill us up. Tact and self-control, the exercise of moderation in all things and a discipline, ambition with attainable aim, a kind heart and truthful tongue. These are the things which smooth the way along the path of life. The maggots that eat away the body of peace and contentment are undue haste, thoughtlessness, indifference, and malice. Do not be unduly afraid of being poor. It is better to have only a few possessions with just sufficient to maintain the health of the body than to have vitality sapping and spiritual innervating abundance of the rich. Happiness cannot be bought. And a joyful heart makes a healthy body. Pure love, not wealth, is the most desirable of treasures, for it halos the brief days of life and fills them to overflowing with spiritual wealth of everlasting value. Along the high road of life, man and woman must walk together hand in hand. The two together are meant to make their joint love a harmonious whole, and the life of one without the other is incomplete. Yet in these times, true matrimonial harmony appears to be one of the most difficult things to achieve because of the spiritual immaturity resulting from the inadequacy of existing religious doctrines. This too must be remedied. Now, um, for those of you who are not married, okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not looking at any of you. I'm not, you know, judging anyone or anything like that. I'm not even commenting on that. All right. Uh, but there is something to be said about, you know, it says right here that like man and woman were intended to unite together. And I, I think this deals with pre-existence. And I think there's something to it. I, I really do. I think that they're, they're like something in our former life where, you know, we have like an entourage of friends up there and companions or family or whatever that somehow corresponds, you know, on earth as it is in heaven, somehow corresponds. And there's what the teaching I went over about a, a year ago now, the, the uh, marriage of Ruachoth and the idea of two separate spirits or Ruach or Ru you say Ruachoth for plural that come together and are united as one and become one eternal uh, interwoven uh, uh, spirit. And this isn't talking about androgyny. It's not saying the woman ceases to exist and becomes sucked in and suddenly he's a man again. That's not what it's saying. Uh, but uh, we were talking, I think, on Thursday night. I was asked a question. It was a great question. Uh, Andrew in this group asked a question, and he was he asked me specifically because a, a conversation was going on earlier about uh, what it means to love yourself. Um, because the the saying was, "Do unto others you would have them do unto your, uh, yourself." Right. So if you're supposed to love others, then what does it look like to love yourself? And the answer I gave, um, I, I said that was one of the most profound questions I'd ever been asked. And I had really had to think about it. But the answer that I gave, I think, lines up with this right here. And that uh, I, I, I didn't truly, I, I said that I, I, I'm really against the idea that you hear all in Hollywood and therapists and other things like that. It's a repeated theme that you need to be okay, you know being single with yourself before you, you know, go with a man or a woman or whatever. I think that's the worst advice. It's basically saying that, you know, you, that it's going against the idea of who you were made for, right? The unity of a man and a woman together. And I gave an answer that went along with the fact of, and I, I really even had a deeper understanding of that of this week, uh, the last two weeks, um, that, I can't really, I never would have truly known what it is to love others or uh, no, let me back that up. I never would have truly known what I needed to love myself uh, without being in a relationship where I love others, right? With my family, my children, you know, I have to love my children and love my wife. And that gave me a kind of fulfillment where I truly understood what I truly needed and it, it, it might have not been, it would, I can tell you, it would not have been the things I would have pursued if I had chosen never to get married and just live, you know, a life of solitude or something like that. It would have looked very different. All right. Um, 
Along the high road of life, man and woman must walk together hand in hand. The two together are meant to make their joint love a harmonious whole, and the life of one without the other is incomplete. Yet in the, okay, I already read that. I'm sorry. I'm, re I'm repeating myself a lot. Let's go to verse 21. Do not be too hasty in judging a wrongdoer, for it may be well, it may well be that though he has been found in some wickedness, the good in him is greater than the good in you. That that's like that really that should convict a lot of us when we just villainize other people and just remember that you know we just we just concentrate on this thing they did and we don't ask ourselves a question. You know, this is what you wish you said. You'll take the the log, the beam out of your own eye before the, you pull the splinter or the speck out of someone else's eye, right? It's like, it's like you're you're concentrating on this one thing, but they may be a way more righteous person than you are. You know, be careful about destroying their reputation or anything like that based on uh, this kind of hypocrisy. Perhaps in the divine view, he is a better man than you are. Disobedience to the laws of men with the sincere and considered intention of doing good is better than the than abject submission to them without any such motive. The golden rule of harmonious living is that a man must master his desires, control his will, and serve his conscience. All right. Moving on to chapter four, defects of character. The man who talks much does so to cover his own weakness. Words of themselves are worthless things, and where there is much talk, there is little action. Words alone are lifeless things having no value until they are quickened within the heart and demonstrated in deeds. Therefore, the rule is never to engage in idle chatter and always to avoid the company of those who babble. Now, setting even babbling and idle chatter aside, um, you know, think about like when you guys are a lot of people, what happens is, is when we come to the truth and they, you know, we, we, we wake up to the reality of the world. One of the, you know, how there's like different stages of, of, of mourning, you know, and uh, it's like, there has to, somebody needs to come up with a chart for the different stages of waking to the truth. Because one of the first things you do is you burn as many bridges as possible. You just go out there and you got to tell everybody about it. Now they need to wake up and you act all crazy. And people are just like, like you're crazy. You know, yeah, you're crazy, dude. And tons of relationships are burned bridges. And one thing for everyone to consider, because I hear from so many of you that your hearts are that, you know, your loved ones, the people you loved would come on board with the commands that they would see the goodness and the righteousness of our Heavenly Father, and that they would desire to conform to our Heavenly Father through doing what Yahushua HaMashiach did, what he instructed us to do. And the problem is, is that we can get caught up in a lot of words and arguing. And, you know, just, this is one of the things, you know, I, I tell people all the time, like, I don't like to argue over scripture, because you show them one scripture verse, and they're like, well, that's not what it says, because I have a different worldview. And it's like, at the end of the day, it comes down to your actions, guys. Your actions are stronger than are the words. Words are weak. It's cheap currency. If you have all words about how wrong they are and how right you are, that that, that means nothing to most people, right? It, your words will have very strong currency if you have action. If you're a person of action, you could show what it is to live a lifestyle that is a tr make you know attractive. And now at the end of the day, the fact of the matter is the ways of y'all are going to be unattractive to a lot of people. There's nothing you can do about that. But uh, to a lot of people, they're going to see that and go, yeah, I want that too. I, I want to live that, that righteous life. And in fact, that has caused many people to walk away from this movement because they see how many people are in here, hypocritical, accusing other people of things, and they are not righteous themselves. All right. Those who find pleasure in chattering and gossip to display the outward signs of a small and irresponsible mind. Those who sow mischief with their tongue can be assured that they will reap the harvest of scorn. Speech is one of the qualities which set men apart from the animals, but it is also a drug to be handled with care. Therefore, treat all words as an apothecary. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Uh, does the drugs of a prescription. So like kind of like a pharmacist, I assume, uh, back then, someone who deals in drugs and 
and medications. They must be carefully measured out and weighed with every precaution taken against an overdose. So you hear about malpractice. Well, think about how your words are actually medicine, right? Medicine for the soul. They can bring, there are, you know, there's big pharma, right? And there are poisons, literally witchcraft poisons. And then there is good health of the soul. And so your word as a creator you are a little creator. You are creating the world around you with either good vibrations or bad vibrations, right? The world is materializing around you as a result of that. And you may be a mal, uh, you may be a malpractitioner of words. Think about that. All the malpractice going on. We, we don't want that. Those who find pleasure in, um, okay, we already read that, the overdose. All right. Overindulgent, overindulgence in talk displays a defective character. Therefore, even when praising another or lauding his virtue, excessive talk should be avoided lest the speaker be accused of hypocrisy or patronage. So like if you go out and just like, you just like, that. actually this isn't a problem today because very few people praise other people anymore. But if you, if, if you felt like being a advocate for such and such person out there, be careful about how much praise you do heap on them because other people are going to be going like, I bet you I can find something wrong with this guy. All right. Uh, effusive speech is the babbling water flowing over a shallow mind. Nothing is more becoming for the intelligent man than silence. And how much more so for one who is not. The motto for those who follow the good religion should be say little and do much. So there you go. Right. Your currency should be in what you do, not what you say. Replace words with deeds. The good will find this no hardship, but the wicked will prefer talk to action. The mouth of a man is like a horse. It must be restrained by firm control and bridle before it can serve him. If allowed out of control, it will carry him off to calamity. Therefore, guard your tongue as you would your wealth, bearing in mind that the less the words spoken, the less the errors made. And of course, Yaakov, the epistle of James is all about this. You know, that your tongue is like the, like the rudder of a ship or that, you know, you need to bridle your tongue. Though all the wisdom of the past condemns overindulgence and chatter, this still grows in volume while the ills of the world do not lessen, though they may change in nature. Therefore, if you would serve the good religion well, hold your tongue in check. Do not overlook it in youth, then in maturity it may pour out wisdom, which will advance the greater cause of mankind. Words are the weapons which give power to falsehood and equip the liar. Lying and deceit are the de defects of character which most reveal its underlying weakness. The earthly punishment of a liar is in the fact that nobody believes him when he eventually speaks the truth, but he condemns himself to greater punishment in the realm of the spirit. Lack of hospitality displays the defects of meanness. Therefore, always be hospitable to the wayfarer and stranger, treating them fairly and with consideration. Do not cheat them or betray their trust and confidence in you, for this is the action of a mean nature. Those who are mean or who lead others into meanness cannot avoid a blemished soul. Few are those who recognize their own defects and fewer still those who honestly, honestly acknowledge them. Even less in number are those who earnestly strive to overcome them, though this is an essential part of life's purpose. Most are hypocrites and self-deceivers whose recognition commences only when they honestly search their hearts and discover what they actually are within themselves. And I can't say this enough that, you know, I talk about gnosis. Uh, of course, gnosis is something that you uh, can only experience. You cannot describe to somebody in words. And that's what the Torah is. It's true gnosis, a circumcised heart. You can't, you can't convey to someone what it's actually like having a circumcised heart if you indeed do have one. And for those who don't have one, they can just, you know, imagine maybe they have one or think they have one or try to imagine what it's like. Uh, but the Torah itself is a transformative document, right? It's not just, it's not just a check off the box and have a hard, a stiff neck hard heart and you'll be a Torah terrorist and go around accusing everyone else of how they're doing it wrong. And they, you know, it's like, no, 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 no. This is about a inspection of you going deep within yourself and saying, how far have I fallen? How can I change? What does the face of the father look like? 
I want to be like that. I want to conform to righteousness. And it's action, not words, right? It's living something out and people go, that guy knows what he's doing. All right. Uh, did I read verse eight? Let's see. Um, okay, I think I did. All right, let's move on to number nine. Eight's a great verse in case I skipped it. But One of the greatest defects of character is sheer indifference and lack of interest in anything beneficial and useful. A man can gain wisdom and enlightenment only when he has labored at reading and dil diligently studied the sacred books. So our life is full of distractions that 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 hamper our character, our soul, handicap it, distract it, creates defective character. And of course, I love that the wisdom is not something that, you know, it's it goes beyond knowledge, as you guys know. Like I, I think wisdom, of course, is a, another type of gnosis. Like you can have a head knowledge, but you may not have the experience itself of wisdom. And this can only come through uh it, it's people ask me all the time because i'm a writer and I, I flesh out a lot of material and people come asking my advice on how to write books all the time they always want to hear something that i never tell them and i told i tell them they're like how do you do what you do how is it that you can turn out this you know 130 page document per week or something like that you know and i'm like okay well uh I, I give an example of like a triathlon, you know, like you don't just run a triathlon. You don't just say, I want to run a triathlon. And you don't do it. You know, you can maybe do that with a marathon. You could go, I, you know, you just run around the blocks a couple of times. And uh, it's assuming that you survive a marathon and you like crawl through the finish line after like 12 hours, whatever the cutoff is and you make it, you know, and you, you like want to die and that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, you got like, you know, <laughs> like disjointed limbs or, or something like that, right? I mean, that's not what you want, right? It takes years and years and years and years to build up, you know, the endurance, the stamina, the strength, the body to run a marathon, you know, a, a triathlon as well. And it's the same thing with, you know, something like any discipline, but with writing, right? It's taken me years and years and years and years since I was um, the second grade, 1988, was when I decided I want to be a writer and I sat down alone. I started writing and people are like, you know, what are you doing with your life, man? Uh, but it's the same thing with wisdom, right? And in attaining knowledge, it takes years and years and years of you sitting alone, opening a book, the sacred books and reading it and going, what does this mean? I don't get this. And then you read another book and then another book. And you're like, wait a second. I, I remember this over here and now I'm reading this over here and now it's starting to make sense. And, you know, and you, you start cross-referencing and you start getting things and you start seeing themes and repetitions. And then it starts becoming a head knowledge and, you know, in your heart. And right. And then all of a sudden you have the explosive gnosis that, of wisdom itself. All right. And that, of course. Yeah. All right. Enough said. Uh, casual thinking about higher things and reading for amusement or pleasure produced no beneficial effect and served no useful purpose. The man who is, of course, they would probably, you know, lose a lung if they found out about like movies today. The man who is dominated by passion and is the slave of his desires is one whose character is weak. He can serve nothing greater than an earthly end. To serve the good religion, a man has to rise above this end and the means for so doing. The reason and purpose is the revelation contained within the sacred books. This is why I keep talking about the transformative document. The man of defective character seeks to live at the expense of others and does not pull his weight. He takes and does not give. He is a parasite on the body of mankind. So there you have, uh, we were, we've been talking a lot about parasites. I'm going to be giving a presentation a few weeks on parasites and uh, how, you know, I, I believe that parasites are probably uh, some sort of spiritual a manifestation, a physical type of demon uh, that is, you know, at war with mankind. And uh, so here you see, obviously, a, a negative. Uh, it seems like I, maybe they had a very good understanding of what parasites were back then and how they relate to demonic possession. Therefore, bear in mind that he who eats from the produce of his own hands is contented in heart and refreshed in spirits. 
but when eating, do not bring discord to the table or consume food while flies swarm or a dog stands by hungry. That would be the saddest thing if I had a dog standing there hungry staring at me and I'm eating in front of him. Don't do that. Throughout the lands of the old religions, people complain that they have little to live for, but it would be more true to say that they have nothing to die for. They can see no purpose in life, but the truth is they can see no purpose in death. They complain they do they do not have see you see as above so below right that the the physicality and the, the the spiritual coexisting here you may be explaining the physicality but you're really explaining the spiritual the existing religions grow old and weak not through age for a religion sustained by faith is ageless but through lack of truth which is the food of good faith they cannot give sustenance which provides strength to deal with the times but the food of the good religion must still be withheld from men for its day remains deep. <clears throat> excuse me, for its day remains deep within the womb of time. In these times, men lack the strength of character to seek fame and seek notoriety instead, but this is no more than fame's horribly distorted image. Men are deficient in the qualities which should spur them to seek fame through service and sacrifice. Of course, you know, as you guys know, most people, I mean, the way to seek fame, the way we are supposed to do it is by getting people to be to worship you, to be jealous of you, to want to be you, you know, that kind of stuff, right? You know, you know, glamorized, uh, you know, riches world, all that kind of stuff. And I mean, I would argue actually that if you're actually living a life of, um, of seeking uh, service and sacrifice that actually probably no one's going to know who you are. They lack the driving force and inspiration, which should come from the national spirit. The fertile fields of inspiration are now overgrown with weeds, and the refreshing waters of spirituality are stagnant. The sun of a new inspiration, the dawn of a new day of hope, will surely follow the night of darkness, or this night of darkness. Then mankind will surge forward once again to storm the spiritual heights, bearing a new standard, a new banner, with the device of spiritual inspiration. Pride is a it, it, one of the things you seem to see in here is that when this book was written, they were saying it was very dark times, and they were they were expecting a spiritual enlightenment to explode on the other side. Pride is a quality of good. False pride. Okay, so remember when I talked to you about uh, pride before, and um, I might even throw in here um, uh, ch uh, ch um, chivalry maybe as a substitute to pride. And um, one, of the, one of the words we could even substitute in here, I think, is um, being, uh, oh, a sense of self-worth or dignity, all right? So that's what I would, you know, if someone wants to say, oh, this is sin because he said the word pride, I'm, I'm, I would like us to question or think about what do they mean in this, right? Not being puffed up, not being that filled vessel that Yah can't use it, not thinking that you have all the answers, that, you know, you want to be worshipped, you want to be seen in a certain way. So, you know, you character, you put on a mask, you wear yourself, like that, that's not what we're talking about here. Um, think about dignity, one's own dignity. Another way um, is we can look at it as like um, when, when Elohim created the world and he said, it is good. Right. He has satisfaction in the work of his hands. He realizes this is good. And so, you know, you want to have that dignity in your household and in your work to say this is good and I'm going to protect that. You know, I'm happy with this and I want to guard that. And I, I, I think that's what they're and that's also a code of conduct like chivalry. All right. So pride is a quality of good. So they're saying here this version of pride, whatever it is, is good. False pride. So I think. Right here, what most people, when they talk about pride, we're talking about a false pride. And this is the pride that the Bible talks about that leads to sin. False pride and haughtiness, so haughtiness is with false pride, are servants of evil. The man who has no pride in himself as a man is weak in character. Obviously, you are weak in character if you don't have, uh, if you don't guard the goodness in you, right? You don't cultivate that. You're going to be a weak character. When a man is without a standard to live by and holds himself in low esteem, any wickedness he does will not appear wrong to him. The laws of men punish the sickness and ills within the nations, but do not cure them. I love that. Laws do not, you can keep passing laws all you want. And we can talk about gun laws, right? You can keep passing all the laws you want, 
that does not that is not uh, a cure to the disease. There's a disease that no human law can cure, and they will give the solution here. Let's keep reading. Uh, the laws, okay. The precepts and moral code of the good religion are the medicines needed to prevent and cure their day will come. If a, so, there it is, right there. You know, living a pursuing the righteousness of the Most High. Um, you know, pursuing our um, escaping our fallen estate and pursuing becoming a son of Elohim is the medicine. Um, and of course, this comes through Yahushua HaMashiach, but the medicine to the disease. And of course, it says that in, of course, the, um, uh, the Torah as well. If a man is more concerned about what others may think of him than about what he knows himself to be, if he fears their judgment more than his own, then he knows the worthlessness of his own opinion. That is like so like amazing. I mean, think about that. Like if you if you are really concerned about what other people think about you, and so you're like, you know, you kind of go with the the major opinion or this or that, like because you, you you know your your um your opinion is worthless. It has no it has no value, right? And so if you can have an opinion that goes against the crowd and you can stand against that and go like, this is why I believe what I believe. And they all disagree. They hate you for it, whatever. It's like, you know that your opinion, your opinion has worth. Man must be made to stand proud in the strength of character and moral integrity. The duty of religion is to make such a man. To be good, a man must not only live a good life, he must also do good deeds. These should not be only such as come his way or result from his inclinations. They must also be the result of effort, search, and sacrifice. Right? We talked about sacrifice. How they just said their inclination. You might have the inclination in a moment to do a good deed, but a lifetime of good deeds is something you have to make an effort to seek out, go out of your way to become that person. Doing good when the opportunity arises is not sufficient. For real merit results only from a hard-fought battle with evil. The man of sound character bestirs himself in the cause of good and diligently studies the sacred books to know what is required of him. He accepts with good grace the task imposed upon him and does not shirk his duties and obligations. He does not try to uh, interpret the words of the sacred books in such a way that things are made easier for him. This is like... Our entire experience in Christianity right there, like you just twist the words so you make it so you can kind of live out in the world and do what you want. And, you know, you're living for the kingdom. Right. You know, and all that kind of stuff. And it's uh, it, you don't have the strength of moral character when you do that. He does not treat their command lightly. Well, there you go right there. Right. The commands have weight to them. Neither does he shun the service they require from him. And there are things that Yah specifically requires of us. He knows that no matter how hard he strives, they can still lead him on toward greater perfection. No man is asked to be perfect. He is asked only to strive towards perfection with all his heart and strength. And this right here, I believe, is the definition of a, a righteous person. A righteous person is someone who conforms to the standard. It doesn't mean he doesn't sin. And so when people tell you that no matter what you do, you're going to, you know, because you read in like James, you know, you break one, you break the whole law, right? And they're like, see, every time it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you eat pork or not because you're going to just break the whole law. And it's like, are you just, it, it gives me a headache listening to this, right? And, uh, oh, I just went blank in my head, but um, I was going to say something. I hate it when that happens. Uh, but, oh, yeah, the, the definition of a righteous person is someone who conforms to the standard. It means that you you desire to keep it. And when you realize that you have fallen here or there, you repent of it. It doesn't mean that you're sinless. It means that in your repentance, you are literally churning back into a conformity to it, to the best of your ability. That is a righteous person. No man can ever be a failure if he strives to do his duty and undertakes all the things he should. But if he turns his back on his duty and shirks his obligations, he is always a failure. And, of course, some people, you know, if they have like, why bother? Why try? Yes, you will be a failure every single time. Even if you fail the first 29, 30 times, 
let's go a higher number than the 32, 33. Even if you, <laughs> most people think I'm going to give a coded message. Even if you fail the first 49, 50 or the first 100 times, you know, eventually, you know, you, you just don't give up. You know, don't, don't just throw in the towel. That's the definition of a loser. Eventually you'll get there. Uh, but it, okay, but if he turn a man who seeks to boost himself by displaying his cleverness is like a commander who reveals all the secrets of his defense. He lays himself open to easy conquest. The defects of character are many and varied, but before they can be overcome, they must be discovered. Know thyself. That is the the quest for the Holy Grail. Know thyself. The words written do not uh, do not give therapists your money if you can help it because they will. Most of them will suck you into that for years and just like a vampire, just drain you and make you dependent on them. And they have all the answers like, like, no, just search yourself out. Know yourself. I, it, it, it's hard for me to believe that anyone is so handicapped that they can't do that. It's really hard for me to believe that. Um, Okay, so let me read this again. The defects of character are many and varied, but before they can be overcome, they must be discovered. The words written here can be no more than a mirror, which is handed to you. Oh, my goodness. James talks about this, Yaakov. Whether you look at the mere reflection of yourself or whether you look with deeper insight and understanding, does it does itself depend upon the nature of your own character? The defects of a defective character may conceal its own deficiencies from itself but they cannot remain hidden if sought in the light of wisdom and truth all right chapter five within your home this will be a good place i'm going to try to get through five and six tonight and um and this will be good though your house is your domain and the stronghold of your privacy keep it open for acts of charity do not close the stores to one in trouble but let all who need it enter and find sympathy let your house be open to receive the window, the widow, I was going to say the window. Uh, yeah, open the window, but uh, let the widow and the orphan in. Maintain your house as a place of contentment and happiness, permitting all members to have their say without interruption or suppression. Uphold its sanctity and the sanctity of your family, whatever befalls, bearing in mind that no sacrifice in doing so is too great, is too great. If the sanctity of your home or family has been betrayed or destroyed, do not be passive. For by doing so, you induce the same calamity to fall upon another. So guard your house, guard your family. Um, unfortunately, you know, I, I was in one of those situations uh, with my, my extended family where it got to the point where I was able to see it very clearly that there was, you know, and it, if I didn't guard my family, my family would have been destroyed. And I had already seen my greater family ripped apart and destroyed by the same spirit. And I had to basically say, can't come in my house and destroy my family. And unfortunately that, you know, that happens sometimes, but it's saying be charitable to people, give them the bit of the doubt, bring them in, but don't be a fool. All right. Don't let other people come in and destroy your most sacred place, your family your wife, your children. Your home is the stronghold of your privacy and ideals, and it enshrines the gentleness of your wife and the modesty of your daughters, or in my case, my daughter. Therefore, do not permit it to be invaded by the tongues of lewdness or allow it its air to be polluted by the breath of the foul mouth. The man who does so displays his lack of pride I would say, um, you know, chivalry, I put chivalry there, his lack of chivalry, and the low esteem in which he holds his family. If you hear lewdness in the privacy of a man's house, know that he is a weak character whose family is to be pitied. Within your house is your home, and this is the life and spirit of the house. Maintain your home as a hallowed place where all that is finest in mankind remains enshrined. Do not argue except to instruct. And do not chastise without understanding and good intent. Never break the peace of the table, for food should always be consumed in tranquility and without haste. I think that there's something to that. You know, when we actually use, you guys have heard me say this so many times, we are little creators, right? And when we go around uh, speaking words of evil or darkness or whatever, negative words that manifest around us, one of the arguments that a lot of people come to me in the uh, when they're reading the Torah, they say, "No, you're not supposed to pray or 
over your food before you eat it. I'm like, where does it say that? Actually, I, I can find references in extra biblical books and beyond where uh, actually Yehusha HaMashiach would, you know, break the food and bless it. Um, you know, like, I guess, I, I guess I, like he's holding up right up here. Like, you know, I, maybe he didn't do that. Maybe he just did it down here. I don't really know. But um, he would, he would bless it first. Right. And, you know, some people argue that you're not supposed to pray for your food to afterwards. I think that comes from, was it Ezekiel Jeremiah or something like that, where, you know, you're, you know, you're supposed to be thankful after you're done, not before you get it. It's a fair point. But the idea is, is that we actually manifest the world around us. And, uh, you know, again, I know some of you bless, say blessing is a trigger word uh, for other things. But you guys know what I mean by this. Um, the, we want to ingest food that is is good food. Um, and so there's a good point here. And in, in, um, uh, let's see, what, what did they say? Food should always be consumed in tranquility without haste. It is the nature of children to be boisterous and get into mischief. Don't I know that? I've got a couple of sons. So the good parent tempers discipline with understanding and tolerance. The good parent is never unduly harsh, but neither is he. So I guess he understands, you know, in some ways, you know, boys will be boys, right? But neither is he lacks an indifference to, to the need of discipline. So don't embitter your child. The proper discipline for a child is maintained through example and guidance not through chastisements. When the need arises to punish a child, this is so good, never do so without asking yourself where you have failed. Ouch. If you care enough for the child, you will be diligent in your heart searching. I mean, this is like a sin of the father's thing. I mean, this is this is hard as a parent, guys. Like, I mean, I, I see my, ch my children act in certain way and I go... I know where they're getting that from, you know, and it's, it's hard. It's hard to deal with that. And then you're having to discipline them for something that, you know, I mean, you have to, cause you love them, but in a way it's like, I have to discipline myself too, to go like, I screwed up. Like I, I, there's a certain action I, or behavior I have that is rubbing off on them and they're acting, you know, it might be a way I talk, talk to them and in, in frustration, you know, and those kind of things. An unhappy marriage is always the result of haste, thoughtlessness, or lack of consideration by both or one. No child should ever suffer for the foolishness or ignorance of a parent. And when dealing with a child, this must be the governing rule. While no one can claim happiness as a birthright, every child brought into the world is entitled to all the happiness possible and all the pleasures of childhood. The son of a man's home is his wife, but he who takes an unchaste woman to wife is one content to live without the warmth of inspiration. The man whose wife lacks the womanly virtues, and we read a lot about the womanly virtues in the Book of Britain, becomes a prisoner to his own shame and his house a place of discord and unrest. A faithful wife crowns her husband with a garland of happiness, but the wife who deceives her husband is like a cancer within his heart waiting to erupt. Within his home, a man is king. I like that line right there. But uh, let's finish light. And his wife is queen. So the, the, king and, uh, the king and queen of the realm in your home is the husband and wife. No stranger should be permitted to trespass on the domain of their happiness. And prying officials should rightly be exclu excluded. Even those who seek to uphold the laws of men shall not force entry. But all worthy men will deal with them honorably and justly. All right. The treatment of women. I think we're going to, well, we might make it through seven tonight. Let's see how we do. I think I need to stop for another drink of coffee right here. All right. No man should be intimate with a woman during the time of her courses. Now, this is, of course, straight out of the Torah. Uh, you're to be separate from your, your wife during the time of uncleanness. For this brings about a subtle pollution, right? So it's right there, right? Uncleanness spreads more uncleanness, so to speak. However, a man may go with a woman after her cleansing without any fear, for this thing stems from the nature of women and is not unclean uncleanliness. So when she's not in her monthly time, it's not unclean to be with her. Seems pretty straightforward. Yet it is to be borne in mind that the sufferings of women at such times are not part of their nature, but a sign of their 
<laughs> I'll let you women get upset about this one. We can discuss this. But a sign of their past failure to maintain the purity of the fountain of life. Now, you know, my view on this is that the, the pains of childbirth and so on and so forth are a result of uh, what uh, uh, Chua or uh, Hava or say Eve uh, did with the serpents in the garden. And so the the, the effect, the consequences are directly uh, responding to the sin. I mean, it would be a very strange thing for uh, our uh, Yahuwah to say, you're going to have, because you ate from a fruit, you know, you're going to have pains in childbirth, right? It, there's a cause and effect that, you know, and I would say that this is what it's directly referencing and, you know, but maybe, maybe they're not, maybe they're saying something else. A man's wife is his own pasture, wherein he may enter as he wills, but he never should be insensitive to her own feelings for an inconsiderate husband reaps a poor harvest. So think about that. Like th this makes total sense. It's like, he's like, I mean, it's, the picture of a pasture is beautiful, right? It's like your wife is your pasture. You may freely roam on this pasture, but that doesn't give you, I mean, if you think that gives you the right to just tread on her, like we're talking sexually here, right? However you want anytime, you're like, you're my woman, you know, you better give me what I want, that kind of stuff. And that happens in marriages. It's like, look, if you're going to do that, you're going to produce very poor fruit. Like you're not actually harvesting this field with, you know, with respect, with dignity, with responsibility. And you have to understand that, you know, the, the, the pasture has needs as well. So that seems pretty straightforward. You have to care for these needs. And then if you respect the pasture and you uh, you know, farm it, you harvest it, so on and so forth, you're going to get a happy pasture that gives you good fruit. A wife must not be subjected to harshness, but should be treated with tenderness and affection. She is deserving of consideration for her feelings are not those of a loose woman who men have treated as they will. So do not treat your wife as a loose woman, treat her with dignity. And this is all, of course, you know, they're talking sexually here, right? So uh, make sure that your, you know, your wife is like, man, my, my husband really cherishes me. He really respects me. And I want to give myself to my husband because, um, you know, he, he holds me not as a loose woman, right? Like, you know, I'm just his play thing. Always treat a woman with reserve and respect, for by doing so, you enhance your own standing as a man. It is the men without pride. Again, I would put chivalry there, or uh, or you know, goodness in your work. It is men without pride in themselves who hold women in low esteem, and women who submit to such men take a perverted pleasure in their own degradation. And of course, it seems like society, you know, really pushes women to you know go with perverted men and be degraded like that's you know this thing that's really praised when all a man seeks in the company of a woman is frivol uh, frivolity and amusement he will in the end seek to use her as an instrument of fornication in fact yahushua says this i mean even in marriage you know people are like you know oh i'm married it's safe now i'm not fornicating and it takes it to a whole new level when Yahushua says in the books of the Nazarene, he says most marriages are fornication. And you're like, what? Like they, they don't have the, 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 the marriage, the union of Ruachoth. They're actually just like, it's not like, there, there's not a union of love there. It's just, it's just totally fornication. All right. Um, let's see. Read that okay. The wise man keeps well away from the chattering woman, for life with her would be like living at the foot of a sand hill. Every man who follows the good religion will treat women with respect and consideration. He will never attempt the seduction of a decent woman, for chastity is the pure blossom of womanhood. Without it, a woman is like a garden tree that never blooms, and she fails to inspire rapture in the heart of any man. And of course, you know, this is. Talk about what it is to be a rib partner, you know, a, uh, a, or a help meet, a help mate, if you want to say that, where a woman is, uh, her role is to make the man a better man, right? To to be there to, how can I guide you on this narrow path? I am here to guide you, to, to perfect your soul, you know, to lead this family, to be the leader, to lead this family uh, towards our salvation. 
Long ages have taught many subtle lessons, and one is that married to a decent woman, a man tends to become better. Make sense? Married to an unchaste or a faithless woman, he tends to become lewd, harsh, inconsiderate, and rude. The man who is willing to take an unchaste woman to wife gets just what such as he deserves. Therefore, treat those who may become the wives of other men as you would want your own waiting life to be treated. This is the best advice I was ever given as a teenager. I was 16 years old. I was going on a, uh, going on a missions trip uh, to Africa for the summer. Uh, I, was, I went to Kenya for, it was about 12 weeks. It was a long trip. So almost about three months or just under. And I went to Florida first to train for it. And the man leading it, he, he, he sat down the guys and he had like the man to man talk with them. Right. And those were his words. He said, every single, until the day you marry, or you're courting a woman to be married, obviously treat every single woman you see as somebody else's future husband or wife. I'm sorry. Treat every woman you see as somebody else's future wife and don't be the cause a blush that, you know, she is now, um, you know, she's not pure now because of you. And when I heard that, I'm like, man, that put the fear of you on me. And I, you know, I, I treated every woman, like I would just go, I would talk to a woman and be like, man, this is going to be somebody's future husband. I don't think it's going to be my, uh, uh, oh man, keep it <laughs> future wife. This is going to be some uh, husband's future wife. And it's not going to be my wife. And I'm going to treat her with the respect that I want my future wife to be treated. Bear in mind the ancient words of wisdom who have stood the test of time and choose a wife with care. Fortunate indeed is he who unearths the treasure of a virtuous woman for her value is beyond estimation and, elf and earthly wealth. The heart of her husband rests on a bed of contentment and he sleeps secure in her constance, constancy. She will never cause him to bow his head in sorrow when men speak of women or to turn his face in shame from the mocking glances of other men. And, um, and think about that, like the idea that a wife could, a man could sleep secure in his own bed, you know, with her, knowing that, you know, he hasn't been brought to shame. The intelligent man does not maintain his wife in idleness, lest her thoughts stray towards scandal and gossip. When the light of the good religion is revealed, it will set the good woman apart from others, and man need no longer walk in doubt. The good woman has pity on the destitute poor, but is not deceived by the wiles of idle beggarmen. Her children are brought up in the knowledge of goodness, and they reach maturity in honor and uprightness. No songs on the lips of men extol the virtues of a good wife and mother. But the silent, grateful song in the hearts of her husband and children never ceases. It's not interesting. It's saying here that it seems like there's not songs that honor um, a good woman, like a woman doing what she's actually intended to be doing, you know, to be a, a wife and a mother and to raise a family of, of young gentlemen. Um, in this day, it didn't seem like they existed, but they say that the, the true song is sung from the heart. <clears throat> it is the holy melody resounding among the universal spheres. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read chapter seven. Yeah, I think we're going to um, get through this tonight. Duties, obligations, and service to life. If a woman is beautiful and gifted beyond other women, then she has been favored by the divine and entrusted with life's greatest treasures. It's saying, it's going to say here that if you're like, if you're one of the, the beautiful out there, you actually have a lot more moral responsibility. And, um, you know, it, you're, it's almost like a more of a test, really. I mean, maybe, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe you're beautiful, like you become be this beautiful on this earth because um, you had, I don't know, you had more reason to be tested. So maybe that should be a little bit humbling for um, some women out there instead of flaunting it. Therefore, <clears throat> she should not conduct herself as other women. For many men will seek after her, and she must be discriminating. She, but she's going to have to realize this that you know she's going to be sought after, and you got it. so her influence on men can be greater than that of other women. So she must always be conscious of its effect. 
Does it make them better men? And does it serve the cause of good? And it, this just really goes for anyone, like for any woman out there. Does, does that woman make those men that she encounters better men? The attitude of gifted and beautiful women is a prime interest to those who concern themselves with the spiritual uplifting and advancement of mankind. Unlike the religions that will die, the good religion cannot ignore this aspect of life. The beautiful woman, if she be good, is proud of being the guardian of such treasure and safeguards it from polluting hands. So, you know, it doesn't mean you're out there, you know, showing your butt off on the beach. Uh, it means that you're actually guarding your beauty from being polluted. She dedicates it to the service of good, which also means the service of mankind. She uses it as a spur and incentive in the upward struggle of man towards divinity. She is more so she's recognizing that there is a, you know, a beauty that, you know, the true beauty should be reflecting, uh, leading us towards, you know, it's a repeated theme by this time, guys. She is more modest and reserved than other women. That's kind of interesting, right? For the more beautiful women that they should be more modest. That's a really interesting thought. And as this increases her desirability even more. She is absolutely discreet and prudent in all her activities. Of course, you know, I think a beautiful woman is, is a, a, a chaste and a modest woman, a woman who these things are described. I think that makes any woman more beautiful of a woman. Her devotion to the cause of good need entail no more than the maintenance of strict female standards of decency in the face of overwhelming temptation. I mean, so, I mean, women out there have overwhelming temptation to not maintain a strict female standard of decency. Maybe you women can discuss that afterwards. I mean, I think that's true. And being a good wife and mother. You know, I mean, it's, it's I, so many stay-at-home moms talk about how they're just, they're looked down upon. Like they're subpar women for doing that, you know, and that's actually what they're, you know called to do. The fires of passion can rage in women as they do in man, but when they do, it should be borne in mind that such striving forces are to be used for good and not wasted on an evil outlet. Men and women are not alike, and their duties and obligations in the divine design are different, even though they share the same urges and desires. The uh, And I love this line right here. Uh the same water is in the river and the irrigated channel, but the millstone and the growing plant do not utilize it in the same manner. So even though the divine is in everything, right? Uh, it, it, and we, and we are man and woman are made in the image of the divine. Uh, it doesn't mean that they are the same, right? They are, they are, there are different purposes, you know, uh, for this, the same divine source. And how you utilize it. The power which serves best serves many different ends. The divine design sets man and woman apart and prescribes for each a different form of service. Women are not called upon to be warriors, though it did say in Book of Britain that you know women could like you know get into archery. They use small swords, not like the big old Highlander swords, but you know you know you could, you could still be a badass with a sword. But they're not called to be uh, to be warriors out in the field, and that's you know the curse of men to be warriors. And men are not intended to bear children. <laughs> Those are fighting words today because a lot of people will argue that a man can bear children. Uh, but apparently abortion is only uh, a, a woman's opinion, even though they say that men can carry children. So they're going to have to kind of change that one around a little bit. Yet the differences of man and woman complement one another and coming together form a harmonious whole. So that's a beautiful picture right there. You know, two halves coming together forming one, uh, you know, it's the marriage of Ruakoth, you know, Eve was separated from Adam, they come together again. It is the duty of everyone to study the sacred books and to try to understand their deeper meaning. All should learn a skill whereby a useful livelihood be earned and knowledge and wisdom should be increased day by day. And the purpose of life is to develop spirituality and further the divine, divine design. It would be utter foolishness to neglect this. Each person should try each and every day to become a better balanced being living a more harmonious life. The obligations of men reach out far and wide, while the obligations of women incline towards the beautification of life and shrine the virtues. And I think that's, you know, a pretty true statement. We hear this all the time that, you know, men are more interested in national politics and women are more, you know, inclined to uh, local politics, you know, like the school board that might, you know, affect their family and children. 
The duties of manhood tend to draw men from home and comfort, while those of womanhood, womanhood tend to draw women to serve hearth, home, and family. Man worships at the altar of duty and obligation, while woman worships at the altar of virtue and service. Both bow before the altars of love. It is the duty of anyone who can, who can to set right what another has done wrongly or in error. No one who has the welfare of mankind at heart can say, this does not concern me or I have no interest in what another does. Do not neglect the welfare of the sick and aged, for this is an obligation each one bears. Visit those who are ill, for visitors break the loneliness of their days. Enter the sick room cheerfully as though it were a pleasure, and not as if you were fulfilling an obligation. Be considerate of their circumstances and do not overstay. Each man should clothe his family decently and feed it according to his means. He should never allow any member of his family to become shabby, unclean, or indolent. When something goes wrong within a house, it shall be the head of the house who will answer for it. Though every child is born with certain tendencies, the parent, parents incline them as they will and therefore cannot deny responsibility for what a child becomes. When the child grows up to be a worthy man or woman, Parents will often hasten to take credit, but when the child turns out to be a disgrace, they are tardy in accepting responsibility. And that's, that. wow, that's so true. <clears throat> Yet the bad is more likely to result from what the parents have done or failed to do than is the good. All right. Um, I think we're going to end that right there. I mean, I could keep reading this, but I um, hope you guys enjoyed that. And... Um, we're going to take this over to the general voice chat and let you guys discuss. Tell me what things you observed that you like, maybe you didn't like, you know, things that stood out to you. If the, I think the recording is going to get cut off here. So for everyone else on uh, in YouTube land or podcast land or wherever else, Shabbat Shalom one last time. And this is one of the great things about attending live is that you can come in here afterwards and take part in the community and speak with everyone and uh, we get along so well, too. It's amazing. We actually like talking to each other. We don't argue. So uh, anyways, I'll see you guys over there.